Friends, welcome back to another very special hobby stream from us here at Tabletop Titans. Zach, and I'm joined today by the only man who has rung the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange, thrown out the first pitch at a Detroit Tigers game, and completed the world's first and only solo climb of K2 in the winter without the use of supplementary oxygen, all in the same day, my dear friend and colleague, Mr. Brett Lee. I'm surprised you remembered all that stuff, Zach. We've only known each other, you know, a couple of years. Yeah, so. um, it's, not, it's not hard to forget <laughs> that you did all three of those things in one day. Uh, Brett, I have a geological science question for you. Oh, yeah, lay it on me. Do you know the difference between a plateau, a mesa, and a butte? Can't say I do. Yeah, I didn't either, so that's okay, Brett. It turns out uh, each one is just smaller than the other one. So plateaus, very big. Mesas, a little less big. And buttes, a little less big. And I thought what I wanted to make today is a butte. But it turns out even a butte is too big for what we're going to be wanting on a tabletop. So I did a little research and I found out what I was looking for is called a hoodoo. Have you heard of a hoodoo? Never heard of a hoodoo, but I imagine we're going to get all into it today. We are going to totally hoodoo it. Are you ready to hoodoo I'm it? I'm ready to hoodoo it up. Let's yeah. hoodoo it. Let's get creative. Okay, guys. Here they are. Hoodoos. You can see they are, well, we actually have the official definition of a hoodoo written on our newsprint today. And a hoodoo is a column or pinnacle of weathered rock. And this is a term mostly used in southwest, uh, you know, U.S., southwest North America kind of uh, terrain setting here. And you can see that's what we're going for. Look at this image here. Those trees from last week with that olive drab look. And the hoodoo is really an awesome piece of terrain for the tabletop. We're going to base our hoodoos. We're going to build them all entirely out of pink foam, okay? And you can see there's that pinnacle. We're gonna put some banding on them and we're gonna even put a little cap on them. And I know you guys are thinking, okay, Zach is just this crazy loon and he's like talking about hoodoos. What is the point of all this? Well, I, like I was saying to Brett, doing this research actually kind of mattered because when I start looking up hoodoos, which by the way, after this stream, I recommend you all do, uh, they gave me a lot of inspiration seeing the different hoodoos. Um, we're going to do some banding today that you'll see. Uh, you can see a little bit on this one, sort of subtle, but when we do the banding, you'll notice that, um, well, it, it looks cool. And when you look hoodoos up, you'll see both the banding. And then I was also reading kind of about how they get made. Let's talk about how a hoodoo yeah. gets made. There's a, we're going to do some geology today. Yeah, and this is actually really great. I was thinking, we, we kind of have a model of a hoodoo. And that if things, Brett, go bad for us here on Tabletop Titans, we could maybe just start a stream where we build geological features and then just like demo them and try to sell them to Absolutely. places. Absolutely, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. And, Let's do it. And, and kids can just like, people at field trips can be like, hey, here's a hoodoo, and they can pull it out. So, so the way a hoodoo is formed, super interesting. Basically, all of this at one point was the ground, right? What happens is you get little cracks in all around here. Water, wind, things that weather, freeze, thaw cycles, get down in the cracks, and they break away. And then eventually, this cap stays. So we're going to do our cap a little bit of a darker color when we get there. And the cap presses down and sort of gives this column strength. Over time, what's going to happen is these layers of rock are all different strengths. So some are like sandstone and wind and water. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Over time, these, one of these weak layers is going to totally fall apart. And then at that point, the top will fall over and then the rest of the pillar is just going to get eroded very quickly. So that's how a hoodoo is made. Very dynamic, yeah. Super dynamic. Um, layers of geology that we want to show, but we don't want to be too... Uh, have two stronger breaks between the different colors. One thing I like about this is uh, it ties back into last week's stream about trees where we were talking about how uh, an interesting tree is one that has very t heavily textured bark to take dry brush, to take paint, to 
highlight those texture features. And this rock formation is like the heavily textured rock formation version of what we were talking about last week. Absolutely. Now, um, before Extreme was even getting started, I was seeing some people in the chat talking about texturing your pink foam. And we're not going to do that today. We're going to build our texture just through cutting, just through the wire cutter. But certainly that is something you can do. Um, we are talking about adding like sand or... Adding like a yeah. sand or like a spackle I've done. Right. Um, today's pink foam work, this is our the first time working with pink foam on the channel. Today's pink foam work is going to be pretty low key. It's kind of like an intro to pink foam work. Um, but I think, you know, I, I mean, I'm making these now for the channel. So it's a topic that is both easy to get started on with pink foam, but also... I don't know, kind of a keeper. Even um, whenever you're going to do any kind of rocky desert outcropping yeah. type type thing. So, what we're going to do today uh, to get started is I'm going to cut some pink foam. Now, a little bit of a word of warning. I'm going to use the pink foam wire cutter, and I want to talk about this tool for a second. I love this tool. Yeah, if, what's that called? Uh, so this is the Woodland Scenics brand pink foam wire cutter. Yeah, uh, Woodland Scenics, not an endorsement. Although I would endorse this product; it works great. I think I've had this for 12 years. I borrowed that from you to do an, a, an, a different pink foam project, and it was really hard to give back because it's it's so it's so fun to it's genuinely fun to use, and it's such a different like it scratches a very different itch when you're hobbying than painting or even airbrushing or gaming. It's it's like you're creating something out of nothing. You have this yeah yeah yeah. It, it's a fun tool and. Um, I would say it falls into the category of tools. You know, we talked a little bit last week about having a 3D printer as a gaming group, like get together and buy a 3D printer. I know that's a lot of money. This thing is about 40, 50 bucks, totally worth it for a gaming group. Um, and I would say probably a super good tool to have. Yeah, and you, like you said, you don't need it all the time, but when you are making terrain, it's, it, it, it makes the, the, the job so much easier and more enjoyable and the, the end result ends up so much better if you have one of these versus using a, a saw or a blade and and just pass it around. If you if you have a friend who wants to do a pink phone project, you can loan it out. Uh, yeah, that's kind of what's happened with this pink phone yeah. wire cutter. Yeah, you don't, um, every person doesn't need one. You just need one for your whole hobby group. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, like Brett said, you can also cut pink foam. A lot of people will use a serrated knife, like a bread knife. Works fine. I've done that as well. I don't love the look. Um, the look is a little too gruff, a little too rough, and um, I, in general, I'm just not like a huge fan of it. So I would say I, I, I like the cutter. I, I have a little more control. Um, I can shape things a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I've seen people do is like a box cutter. You extend the blade all the way, so you have like five or six inches of, of blade sticking out, and then you can, it, the noise is terrible. If you've yeah. ever tried, it, that's reason, like f fingernails on a chalkboard noise. And that's reason enough for me not to enjoy that tool. But this, yeah, you can't do a lot of these fancy curves and intricate shapes with, with a blade. You really need a, a wire. You need a wire. And the final, the box cutter thing also has this other issue. Um, this is a science thing, which I don't, we talked about this last time. I don't really know a lot about science, but there's some weird, I, I think it's magic. Pink foam just immediately blunts blades. Oh yeah, it, it, it <clears throat> dulls the blade really fast for some reason. Yeah, it's magic. It's, yeah. it's like science magic. Um, now there's another way of doing it that people will kind of do perforations and then knock it out. And you can do that too, or just break it. Um, that, that's, not, that's not bad, but again, I, I don't think you can get kind of the fine shape that you, that you get with this guy. Let's yeah. talk about... Yeah, show us how it's done. Let's talk about this. So, pink foam, pink foam wire cutter, highly recommend it. Um, you know, real quick, final thing before we get into it, I would say um, about pink foam, which, by the way, um, that's what we call it mostly in the U.S. It has different names, different parts of the world. Specifically, what I use is actually, again, a brand name called... F uh, it's Owings Corning Formula or something like that. Um, I've been using this stuff for years. In California, it's mostly sold in two by two, um, two by two project slabs, which is what I like. This is actually a piece that I borrowed from you, Brett, because I went to go get some yeah. in preparation for the stream, and they were out. They're sold out. Yeah, maybe lots of people making hoodoos right it's now. It's used for insulation <clears throat> in houses, right? So uh, it's uh, uh, if if house if house <laughs> if construction industry is going gangbusters, they're going to be all sold out of this at your home improvement store. 
Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, I ended up with this this piece, and we'll we'll, we'll work with this piece here today. Um, we mostly have done the cutting that we're going to do for the for the stream already, but um, want to show you guys a little bit of, of how to work with this and the wire yeah. cutter. Um, anyway, the, what I was starting to say is highly recommend it as a tool to work with, both pink foam and the wire cutter. Um, we're about to be finished here today with a bunch of hoodoos. Last week we did trees. We can make forests. This board that we're making for the stream, this, this canyon board, it is sort of done after tonight. You could take it over to Tabletop Titans on the stream. They could use it. I'm actually going to ask Pester Adrian to, to at one point play with it this way. Wilderness only. No ruins, no kits. Um, we'll talk about the hoodoo and, and kind of the, the rules it can have uh, a little later in the stream, but you would have a complete board just with the hoodoos yeah. and the woods. Yeah. Give it some relevant keywords <clears throat> and you're good to go. Okay. Let's get cutting. Before we do, last thing, promise, last thing this time. I'm about to cut pink foam with a wire cutter. It is going to make a fume. That fume is super dangerous. We don't have a great way here <laughs> to have an exhaust system that doesn't also basically over overpower our sound. If I put a mask on, I can't really talk. So I am about to basically um, shorten my lifespan, maybe a little bit, a few months. Yeah, don't do this at home. Don't, don't. Please do this outdoors or with a mask or some kind of ventilation. Yeah, I actually at home, I, I sit right by an exhaust fan that I can have blow out into the environment to, I guess, probably deplete the ozone. And I, I kind of do it that way. So it's just going straight out the window. Um, we're not going to do a lot of cutting on stream, probably ever, until we get some kind of system in place. So it's dangerous, but um, be a little careful. You know, don't do too much unless you have good ventilation. All right, let's cut. Yeah. The wire cutter, super easy to use. <clears throat> when I uh, push the yellow button, maybe we could actually do like a the yeah. over the shoulder view here, Brett, as I cut. Uh, when I press the yellow button, Again, some kind of techno science magic goes in between these two, and this wire is now ready to cut pink foam. I've never cut my skin with the wire. I've never touched my skin with the wire. People ask, does it hurt? And the answer to that is, I don't know, guys. I have no clue. I've never tried it. It's never happened on accident. So, can't answer that. Um, not sure. Have you, have you uh, cut yourself with it, Brett? Uh, no. But I think it's one of those things that you only do once, and then you're like, never gonna, never gonna, <laughs> never gonna touch that ever again. Yeah, I'm like not one of those people that's like, oh, let's see how this hurts. Yeah. If I see like this thing that can just cut through foam, like a knife can't cut through foam. I very think that well. also that's why they have it. It's a momentary switch. You can't just flip it on and have it stay on. You have to like continuously hold it, and that's their attempt to. To reinforce the idea that you don't you don't want to touch this. So here now um, I've got kind of the, the the foundation for the base. This is obviously not the kind of shape we want for our hoodoo's base. Um, so I'm going to carve up, do a little shaping on this thing, and uh, as you do it, keep in mind that when you cut your initial hoodoo shape, it can only get smaller, and it's going to get smaller because, as you can see here, I'm cutting kind of at an angle, and I'm just putting a little bit of shaping into it here. There's always more we can do. You're not gonna mess this up. Super easy. The worst thing that can happen, I guess, is the wire can touch your skin. And again, hasn't happened yet to me. I've been doing this for maybe 10 years, geez. I've definitely been cutting pink foam longer than I've been airbrushing. It looks like you're putting a little bit of a slant there on the edge. I am. We want it to have, you know, kind of like a little bit of a slant, show that it's got a little bit of topography. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I like to do a pretty aggressive slant. Some people do much, uh, well, wait, let me think. Is, am I describing that right? The angle is fairly obtuse. Is, is that right? Uh, Not acute. There you go, yeah. Obtuse, yeah. Yeah. So if you do a very acute angle, I think you kind of end up with something that looks like not quite right. Here's the deal. When I am making terrain... That looks amazing. We always talk about this combination of realism versus looking cool. Yeah. 
Um, that's kind of what I'm going for. I'm trying to sit in a place right between those two. Um, Can I say one thing I love about this is all of the sort of little micro textures on the cut surface that's going to pick up the edge highlighting and the, the dry brushing that we're going to do later. I think when I first got started with pink foam cutting, I was trying to do very smooth, very precise cuts and try to make it as smooth and contoured as possible. And I think it ended up looks it ends up looking much better this way, where you've got or you've got some some texture to it that looks like an actual it was formed in nature by water and wind. Thanks, Brett. And uh, I do appreciate that. I have I've tried I've tried to get a little better at pink foam over the years, um, but it's easy to get into. And you're exactly right. The big thing is, remember, dry brushing is going to be a humongous part of this project. And what that means is you want to give yourself space for the dry brush to work. Um, last week we talked a little bit about the, the tree bark, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> a barkier tree, a rougher tree, rougher tree bark is going to give you better effects. Yeah, with, it's just more visually yeah. interesting. And, and we're doing more dry brushing today, and, and think about dry brushing. Where do we dry brush? Last week I saw some people mention we dry brush fur. That's right, we dry brush fur, fur we dry brush tree bark, yeah. we dry, dry brush rocks. We dry brush nature. It's like, yeah. you don't really, we said, you don't really want to be dry brushing like a Tao hammerhead. We dry brush uh, Xenos alien skin also. Uh, yeah, sometimes skin. Skin, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. Um, Tyranids. Na nature stuff, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, here now is, I'm pretty happy with this now. A couple things. This shape, kind of bland. Lots of times I like to do a little bit of a kidney shape. And the reason we want to do a kidney shape in ninth ed, folks, uh, if you're watching this in 2021 and we're playing ninth ed Warhammer, then this piece, this hoodoo, is going to be obscuring. We're going to give this hoodoo the obscuring keyword. And the re way we're going to do that, we're going to make sure it's five inches tall, but the kidney shape just kind of helps people tuck in a little bit more, like if it's in their deployment zone, holding this up here to kind of show you guys. Uh, the the kidney shape, it's, it's not strong, it's subtle, but we can just tuck in, you know, a few little guys back here a little bit better um, and really confirm that we're out of line of sight, especially like at the start of the, the, the turn. Yeah, it gives it some... Uh, directionality to it. You know, it's not just homogenous from either side. It, it means that you can put it down and it'll have an advantage if you're on one side of it as compared to the other side, and that can be a thing that you play with during your terrain setup. I like that. The other shape that uh, that we always talk about, the guys love these L shapes, oh, yeah. right? So this is the other hoodoo that I, that I made already, yeah. um, and the L shape is good too. Um, we're going to talk about how we kind of doctor these hoodoos up a little bit on the battlefield. For now, though, moving on, I'm going to pass this to Brett. Brett has been tasked with, with priming this. Now, how are we going to prime this? Uh, I was asked, I think, on the, on the stream the other day, someone said they've, they've aerosol sprayed pink foam. If any of you have done Ooh. that, you know what happens. It melts. It, it melts yeah. in like a real body horror yeah. kind of way. Like, um, <clears throat> like you got splashed with acid. Real Cronenberg stuff. You know, David I mean, Kirk, I've never like, seen anyone get splashed with acid. Yeah, Re real gross. If, if you've ever seen a Batman movie, you know exactly what this is. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, any Batman movie. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Um, so, wh how we're going to... First, we're not going to use aerosol today, but what we're going to do to prepare this to be painted with... I use this, again, not, not an endorsement. I use this in, in the U.S. and probably Canada... Uh, Rust-Oleum brand, Painter's Touch, Ultra Cover, Premium Latex Paint. What you're looking for is any kind of black, I recommend black, any kind of black indoor-outdoor latex paint. Um, today, we're going to put just one coat on because we're going to airbrush. If you do want to aerosol spray, I've, I've done these tests, folks, many times. We wanted to know, uh, my gaming group and I wanted to know, can you aerosol spray pink foam? after you've latex painted it? The answer is, at least with this brand of paint, you can after two coats. Yeah. One two, coat. Two thick coats. Two pretty thick coats. One coat, uh, maybe, if you're good. 
uh, if you got it. But if you any little spot, yeah. then it's gonna just yeah. like a hoodoo. It's gonna it's get gonna in there in and there. melt yeah. away. This is this is erosion <laughs> at an ex accelerated pace. Very very accelerated <laughs> chemical erosion. Yeah. So you you want some kind any kind of layer of material um, that is going to create a physical barrier between the foam and the aerosol is good. I like to use the paint because. It serves as a primer anyway. Yep. So Great. I'm going to give this to Brett. I'm going to give this to Brett. I've got my brush. He's got his brush. Brush and Brett. What kind of brush is this? You told me this. This today. is called a chip brush. Um, you can buy these in bags. Uh, Ten of these will be, you know, two fifty at the hardware store. They're meant to be disposable, and so they're great for this kind of thing where uh, you're just going to put some paint on and then, you know, do a project. You can do, you know, use one of these for a session and then. Uh, be done with it. Throw on the garbage. Now, um, one of the things some people had asked for after last week was that we include our materials. We did that today, so you'll see a, a, a paste bin under the under the stream, and um, that will include all the materials. So, if you thought that was a sponge brush, like I did, and you're like, <laughs> they used a sponge brush, um, it's called a chip yeah, brush. Yeah, if you go to the painting department and ask for a sponge brush, they'll be like, okay. Uh, I think you're looking for Michaels. I'll, that's uh, a, I'll, I'll take you over here. I'll take you to over to the sponge <laughs> brushes. <laughs> yeah. They send you to a craft store. They're like, yeah. Um, okay. While Brett does that, um, because there's really not a lot to see there, um, he's in control of the camera, so he can zoom in on himself doing that if he wants at some point. Maybe why not, right? I can just do like this, so we can both be on camera. <laughs> there we go. Um, so while Brett is while Brett is doing that, I'm going to get started on the actual hoodoos themselves. So the hoodoos, we're going to use these extra pink foam chunks that you're going to accumulate as you cut the bases. Now, you kind of want ones that are have a decent amount of shape. Remember, again, we're cutting them down as we work. So these ones right here um, that I trimmed off, probably not big enough. You may be able to save these for something. I, I'm actually not going to. I'm just going to set them aside for now. Um, won't need those for the rest of the day today. Um, oh, got my, got my spare wire in case, in case the wire cutter breaks. Um, OK, so what I'm going to now do is form some hoodoos. And I start. I have two little blocks here. I did as kind of a test. Um, setting these down. Going to cut a few more. Almost done. Gassing myself with pink foam fumes for the day. It's fine. Um, you know, we're just just uh, don't breathe. Yeah. Just hold your breath, and it'll be okay. Hey, um, did you know that uh, Brian and Adrian are in chat? I think I saw that Adrian's in chat. Yeah, I'm uh, not even sure I knew Brian. Brian, Brian is uh, is alive and uh, and in chat even. That's great because people have really been worried about Brian. Everyone's been wondering where he is. Well, you can ask him now. You can ask him. Yeah. How's how's it going, Brian? Super glad to hear that he's alive. Although we we knew he was, but um, I'm glad that more people other than just us know this now, so we can <laughs> stop asking guys. <laughs> Um, okay, so I've got some blocks set up, and here comes the fun part. So you are going to use for this project these skewers right here. These are kitchen skewers. You can see mine have been used already to make some hoodoos. I made some hoodoos in preparation for this stream over the weekend. So what we're going to do is we're going to stack these blocks now into basically like little meat kebabs of pink foam. And uh, then we're going to cut them that way, and we're going to paint them that way. And in fact, they're going to stay on these skewers until they're pretty much done. Can I ask a question, Jack? <clears throat> yes. Um, two questions. How yes. much should I concern myself with drips? Well, are these going to get covered up later? They, the the thing that you want to keep an eye on. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a great question, by the way. As this dries, yeah, is any kind of actual droplet-like formation right. will take shape, and we will have to interact with it and it'll be there forever. And in fact, I can actually show, um, right away we put uh, the, when we did the glam shot of the hoodoo spinning, yeah. there's, I saw right away uh, earlier today, I was like, ah, I missed, I missed a little droplet. So it does happen. So what you wanna do is like, that's probably good now. Okay. So you probably wanna just set that down, let that dry. And then do I need to do the bottom? That's my second no, question. No, in fact, what I would do is I would take the edge of this brush, yeah. and I would go around and I would clean up the bottom. Okay. Yeah, just like that. 
And then the thing is when you now set that down on the newsprint, it's gonna dry. And when it's really dry and you go to pull it off, it's gonna rip a bunch of the newsprint off with it. Oh, yeah. That's okay. Okay. Um, but but if you're doing if you're gonna aerosol this, you probably do want to do the bottom, right? No. Just don't just, just make sure don't it's, aerosol. Yeah, just don't aerosol <laughs> the bottom. No, you don't need to. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. So what I'm gonna do now is start stacking these. Uh, and here's the fun thing about hoodoos, they have varying shapes. It's not like you have to go large to small. Now most of mine are fairly similar shape. The first hoodoo I always make for, for uh, the, the base is the hoodoo that is five blocks tall. Now you could do just four blocks and that would make the piece five inches you're thinking, right? Because the base is one inch, yeah. and then you have four blocks. Oh, that's super convenient about this. It's one inch thick foam, so you, if you have five stacks of it, you instantly know that this is five inches. Exactly. Yeah. So, four stacks plus the base. You're thinking, my hoodoo's done, right? I don't need a fifth one. Not really, because we are gonna play around with the top a yeah. little bit. Yeah. So we want um, to really make a six inch tall hoodoo, and then cut down into the five inch range right, a little bit. Right, because we're, we're trimming down the top a little bit to, yep. to, to round it off. So, that makes sense. with your final, <clears throat> if you guys can see this, with your final, I've got a little point sticking out the top. You actually don't want to have the last hoodoo go all the way through or you'll have a hole. You guys will be able to see um, in the videos, some of mine have holes in them. <laughs> um, it's not ideal, but the final one, we just stick it right here like this. <clears throat> And there we go. We have yeah. what oh, nice. really looks like kind of like a wacky hoodoo pop. Yeah. Pink foam pop. It's not yet a hoodoo. It's going to be. Okay. Uh, Brett, let me let you make some hoodoos. Okay. So I'm going to give you four here, two groups of four. You can do, you don't have to use them all. You can use four, three, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know what? We forgot one step. I actually have to take all these hoodoos off. We're going to glue these. Now, what type of glue should you use? Actually, I use what is called, uh, P I think people call this, what, PV, this PVA glue? PVA yeah. glue. Uh, white, it, white glue? In the U.S., this is Elmer's, is like the big brand name. I got a nice bottle of Elmer's here, brand new. And you're just going to put a little bit here on, uh, yeah, if you want to maybe go to the top down or the over the shoulder, shoulder, perfect. Just like that. Okay, and then I just stack these on. Now, can you use other types of glue? Yes, you can. Oh, that's my top hoodoo. Uh, so you can use other types of glue. I also used, I ran out of this at home over the weekend while I was making these. And what happened is I was like, well, you know what? I'm going to use the only other glue I have, which is around here somewhere. Um, I think I put it away. It's he Gorilla Glue brand, heavy duty construction glue. Yeah, I think uh, construction adhesive is another great option for this. But, you know, in the vein of, like, not buying specialized products when a general general one will do, like, PVA glue is useful for so many things. No reason to buy a specialized adhesive just to glue your uh, pink foam together when, when you've already got PVA glue lying around. Totally. And here's uh, another reason that I would actually recommend PVA glue over the Gorilla Glue that I used, when this all dries, you you will want to get the skewer out. Now, I guess you don't have to get the skewer out. You could just cut it and glue it that way, uh, like like this with, with like wire clippers or something. But um, when when I went to take these out, the skewers out, um, to, to stack them on the base at the very end of the project, the ones that had been PVA glued came right out. The ones that had been Gorilla glued, I had to use these pliers grab it and twist it. And this is really cute and you guys are wondering, boy, that must have been funny. Well, hang in there because we're gonna have to do that today because oh, these these uh, cooking show magic uh, hoodoos that I, I prepared it. for the weekend have mostly been grilled glued. Okay. So you can see like, I think, oh, that one was, of course, Sunk. I grabbed one of the ones that was PV, <laughs> PVA glued. Um, some of them are gonna be really hard to get out and it'll be just like a fun surprise for you and me to like, have we'll to end up elbowing each other in the yeah. face as we're pulling skewers out of hoodoos. <laughs> it's like, oh, that one was grilled. I never thought glue. I'd say that combination of words. But. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay, so here it is. Okay. Yeah, and oh, let started. me pass you the glue. Yeah. Okay. Um, here it is, and so now I'm going to shape my hoodoo. Let me ask you an artistic question. Yeah. Do you uh, feel that 
starting with sort of bigger blocks on the bottom and progressing to smaller blocks on the top makes sense? Or does it give it a little more visual interest if you kind of start small and then go big and then small again? Um, I try to be erratic about it because I was reading that that's how hoodoos do. Yeah. I feel like I get hung up on some of that stuff when I'm doing these kinds of projects. Like, what's the right way to do it? I have to, I have to do it the right way. And then turns out there is no right way. And I just end up spending hours hemming and hawing about something that doesn't matter. Yeah, um, it's, it's fair. You're not, you're not alone in that. I do that as well. Um, and then I do try to always, especially when I'm making terrain, I do try to always ask myself, how much does it matter? <laughs> um, and the answer frequently is, is, is not much. Now, one technique I'll show, uh, Brett, maybe just for a sec if we could go over the yep. shoulder here. One kind of fun technique I'll show that I, I, I thought got kind of a cool shape on the hoodoo is you turn your wire cutter, you engage your wire cutter, and then you just kind of twirl this thing around. And what's cool about that is it's going to give you like a very windswept look. Oh, I love like that. Yep. That's great. See, and you get this kind of interesting curve there. And, you know, again, these are in desert canyons, and that means they get attacked by a lot of wind. And so uh, once, you know, a formation, once a wind finds a good path, it's going to do that for what? It's geology, so it's going to do that for what? Like a 500 million years? At least uh, yeah. several hundred thousand trillion years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, right? I feel like... Um, at least 40,000 years, Zach. At least, for, yeah, there you go. This hoodoo, what we're building right now, these hoodoos will be gone by the time... Uh, we're building them today, and then in the year 40,000, actual spa superhuman space shoulder, shol <laughs> soldiers will have battles on them. Yeah, by the time Brian gets back with his ultramarines, these hoodoos are going to be are going to be thousand suns. <laughs> Fossilized hoodoos. <laughs> yeah. So uh, come, coming together here, again, I actually want to get like any kind of sharp corners off because that's not natural looking. Now, if I was doing, this would be a cool way to do pillars for like a ruined city of marble. And if you were doing something like that, you might want to keep some of the sharp corners to kind of show that, give, give a little bit of that man-made suggested okay. look. So I was, here, I'm going to switch here. Yeah. I was intentionally trying to sort of stagger the corners of the square, and you're saying that I probably shouldn't do that. No, you just... can totally do that. Okay. Yeah. This is me getting caught up on details that don't matter. Right, no, I mean, Live and in real time. You can or not. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter. The big thing that you want to make sure you don't do when you start cutting, you don't want to cut down to your, to your skewer. Um, I, I did a few of mine the, the, this past weekend, and it, you can kind of work around it, but usually when I did that, I just disassembled the hoodoo, took that one out, either put a new one in or not. Uh, okay, so this is this guy's looking pretty good. So I've got a five tall skewer. Should I work on a three tall skewer? Yeah. Okay. Totally. Um, okay, and so I'm thinking that as far as hoodoos go, this one is is pretty close. We're to pretty who done. done. Pretty yeah. Pretty who done. Uh, I, I wonder how much mileage we can get out of this. This is going to be a very <clears throat> puntastic uh, episode. Yeah. Um, so there we go. There's my hoodoo. Uh, can, we get a, can we get a front view? Um, I guess I could put the hoodoo on the glam cam. I don't know. Let's see how well the hoodoo glam cams. I'll like put it over here and just spin it myself. There we go. Look at that. Look at that hoodoo. It kind of looks like a weird, disgusting version of um, like a kebab chunks of meat. It's kind of weird. Anyway, it's going to be great when we paint it. We're not going to paint this hoodoo today. We're going to do a little cooking show magic. Uh, so, Brett, how are your hoodoos coming along? Uh, great. I'm almost done. Yeah. Do uh, we want to do we want to take questions? Do we have? Yeah. Uh, we have a few. Cuz um, I cuz we're 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 pretty close to done carving. Yeah. So, you've got a little carving to do. You know what? Um, but I'm happy to, to answer a question or two while I clean up a little bit. Why don't we finish area. this one? Ooh. Here. While I sort I'll you, out. I'll also let you carve. Details. Thank you. All right. Uh, our first question today is from Devram. Thanks, Devram. Love the hobby stream. Packed full of useful information. As the titans with the best music taste, have either of you experienced chap hop? Uh, Devram, I... I regret to inform you, I don't know what chap hop is. Chap hop. Uh, no, I haven't. Um, I'm going to look into it. Yeah, we should look that up. 
I have to say that, um, so, so I, I, I teach, like Adrian, um, have a background teaching, um, and a background teaching music and, and music theory and music composition. And I do have to say that I'm really into, um, as somebody who's almost 40, I am really into um, f like listening to new music. Um, because, you know, I, I get these kids and, and they're like, oh, I like this style of music. And I don't want to be that guy that's like, that's crap, listen to Nirvana, you know. So, um, and the more I've done it, the more it's, it's shocker been good, you know, and I've liked a lot of it. So uh, I will definitely check out Chap Hop. Yeah, ditto. I love it. Um, Devram, I think you know uh, I'm pretty much a 90s ska punk kind of guy. So if it is, if you're suggesting this, I'm assuming it's similar in <laughs> uh, in genre to that. But maybe not, in which case I'll discover a new music genre and my life will be changed. Yeah, one way or the other. Possibly maybe, for the better. Maybe for the better. Probably maybe. for the better. Hopefully for the better. Because frankly... I don't know, I wasn't a very uh, happy kid when I was yeah. 17 and... <laughs> Man, you know, what, you know what's so funny about that? Uh, a few years back, my wife and I were like, oh, let's let revisit some of this 90s music. And we made yeah. this big playlist on Spotify, kind of anchored around like Nine Inch Nails and, and uh, Nirvana and those guys. And we were listening to it for, over the course of the weekend and playing some, playing some board games. We could play a lot of like two-player board games together. And there was this point where one of us said something like, um, wow, I, I feel like a little more depressed than usual. Yeah. And, and then I think I said it, and my, Megan was like, yeah, me too. And I, I was, you know, I, I think I'm reading into it, but we were both a little bit like, is it the music? It's the music, <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely the music. Um, I, yeah, so warning, <clears throat> uh, maybe more dangerous than pink foam fume, actually. Mm. So, um, Okay, well, I am waiting for you, Brett. Uh, uh, this is going to take me a sec. Yeah, take your time. Uh, do you want to prime your your uh, oh, yeah. voodoo spire? Uh, no, that's okay. I don't, actually. <laughs> okay. But that's all right. We're going to set these aside, and we're going to get uh, the next step ready. Yeah, shall I, just, shall I just set this down? I mean, I'm having fun, but I also realize I'm... No, I want you to have your fun. ...constructing progress. No, you're, it's good. And in fact, actually, here's a good idea. Uh, you can answer another question. Yeah, I could answer that. I'd be happy to do that, actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, could answer another question. Uh, ready? Yeah, what do we got? Okay. Uh, thank you, Melody Wallace. Hot wire cutter, more like hot guy o lover. Oh my gosh, oh, that's wow. a pun. <laughs> uh, the boys are looking great tonight. I'll be hobbying at home. Two immolators and an exorcist. Um, good luck. Uh, yeah. Have fun. That's awesome. Um, hobbying is a great thing to do while streaming or while watching while watching other streams. Yeah, uh, Bridger is also directing us to another question. He's in the studio, and he's behind the camera dancing and stuff for us. Um, Magnus, are we hungry? Thank you for asking. You know, we never ask for food. Um, we 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 just wouldn't do it. So it's your call. I would also say, and I think I've said before, we can probably always eat. Um, but we would never ask for food. So we leave it up to you and uh, to decide that. We're happy either way. We're just happy you're here. Um, your call, Magnus, totally. Um, and thank you so much uh, either way, no, no matter what you Yeah, mean, mostly so. we're just here to hang out and, and uh, make, make, some, make some hoodoos make and some hang hoodoos. out with you guys. Yeah, we're mostly here just to make hoodoos. Yeah, we would it, be doing general. this anyway <laughs> if there were not cameras on. Yeah. <laughs> um, Melody, that's awesome, uh, and as you know, of course, um, Sisters uh, coming out pretty soon. Uh, we'll talk a little bit at the end of the, the stream today about what's coming down uh, Saturday on, on the channel. Obviously, um, you know, Sisters, since they're coming out, but great, it's awesome that you're getting ready. Um, let's talk a little bit more about, that looks good, yeah. Am I done? Uh, I would, if, if I could make a suggestion. Yeah. The only thing I would do different is I would see this yep. flat part of the top. Yep. I like to try to get the hoodoo to not have oh, the flat cool top. Oh, that's a cool idea. Yeah. Okay. Um, I feel like it doesn't look super natural, or it doesn't look natural. <laughs> it doesn't look particularly natural. Maybe too super natural. Right. Um, awesome. So while Brett is 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 finishing up, uh, we I actually took a little bit of footage earlier today. I want to show some other things you could do with pink foam. 
um, some other geological formations you could make, both uh, actually, no more hoodoos, to be honest with you. More like slabs and hills. Uh, Brett, do we have that queued up? I'm asking like Brett to do everything. And his fingers are Sure, let's do it. Um, so, uh, oh, Brett, could you actually pull up? Do we have that on OBS? So I can kind of see what the, yeah, here we go. Um, all right, so what you guys are looking at right here, uh, this board is actually being used this week on the stream. So, uh, Feel free to hop in tomorrow or Saturday. You'll see the, the guys playing on this. Um, that was obsidian, and I had like gloss that over with a high gloss. Uh, this next one you're seeing, we've got like these hills. Actually, you flock the top of them and burrowed some magnets so those trees would stick like that. Um, pink foam is so, uh, you can just do so much with it. Um, so, I, yeah, I love making kind of grassy hills. Finally, um, this is the purple board. Maybe you guys have seen this on the stream. Um, very uh, line of sight blocky rocks right here. And I put a little turbo dork blue raspberry color shift paint on the bottom of these to give them that kind of um, metallic uh, iridescent kind of look. Um, I don't know, I just wanted to try something a little different. Pink foam is such a great place to try stuff because when you're starting, when you're starting pink foam, and you, uh, you, you, get, you get your hoodoos or your, your slabs or whatever it is together, make, make some extras that you think you might not need. Super awesome to practice airbrushing, practice weird techniques, and if you totally screw it up, you're out like 40 cents, maybe. And if, and if it turns out amazing, <coughs> great, keep it. Yeah, exactly, so. <laughs> You've got an extra slab. Um, yeah, that, that, the, the, the purple rocks there, I, I was doing that board up for Brian, and I, I, I had him finish, and I, I like to color match to, to mats, um, which we did with, with this one as well. And, I, you know, it was done and I was looking and it just it felt a little flat. So I said, you know what, I'm just going to try this. And it really worked. It, I, I was happy with it. So we're now moving on to our next step. We have some cooking show magic here, meaning we're not going to work on these ones that we just did. Brett's is actually drying here. You guys can see, uh, even from this view, it's it's still a little glossy. We talked about this being a problem. We're going to stick to this paper, which is why I'm just going to take this paper wholesale yeah. and put it behind me here. And, you know, it's not, It's it, in some ways it's not a problem because uh, you're going to yank that off. It's going to tear up some of the paper and, you know, that's that. Okay, so what I have for us, Brett and I, right now. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Fast forward. Oh, I think. Um, fast forward. Sorry, Mike, uh, Mike <laughs> fell off. <laughs> These aprons. Technical difficulties. Yeah. Um, so what we have right here are some fast forwarded cooking show magic hoodoo pops. Great. Um, whoa, whoa, we've got, we've got more than this. Oh, these are all okay. mine? So I'm giving Brett That's the, great. the, the hoodoo pops here. Yeah. Those ones, Brett, if you want to hold one of those up, um, black, that's what it's going to look like. This guy right here has actually already been, um, first coat of paint on it. Kind of show you guys what that looks like. We're gonna go through the paint colors here in a second. Okay. Um, we each have like our little craft kit here to get going. I love it. Uh, we're gonna do some airbrushing, guys. Now. So which color are we starting with? What's this brown color? This brown color is AK. I'm using AK brand paints today, which I've not actually used before. Um, I went in to my local game store, Game Castle Santa Clara, right down the street from us here, and I went in and I said, uh, who's got what line of paint very well stocked right now? Um, and I said, okay, let's try some AK. And I, I love this color. It's, it's called black red. And um, That's funny. This doesn't look like black or red. It looks like brown to me. But. Yeah, it, it's a little bit of a brown, right? <clears throat> um, this is our, our, our very first base coat. The reason we even put this coat on is so that any kind of shadows that show up on, on, on the piece... Um, it won't look so stark. So I, I love colors like this. Um, most of my armies, most of my trains start in some version of pretty much black with a slight tint to it. This is effectively a base coat. Yeah. Yeah. And why do we, really, that is that is why we base coat. We base coat so that when blacks show up, when little nooks, little crannies show up, they are not so black. True black, like super black, like a bad in black Citadel brand. Yeah. That's very rare in nature. It's, it's, it's kind of shocking to see that actually. So 
Um, we are want you thinning some... any of this at all? Nope. Didn't Just need straight to. out of the bottle. And these are not <clears throat> airbrush paints, right? These are. These are airbrush paints. These are. Yeah. Okay. Um, I pretty much last week okay. I was mentioning. Yeah. I pretty much only use airbrush paints, cool. um, whether I'm doing airbrush painting or not airbrush painting. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna get the the wire cutter. I can make a little space for us here. Wire out of the way. Anymore. Uh, so the base has already been done, like I said, and we're going to move on to the actual hoodoo itself. Here's the fun part about airbrushing a hoodoo, making sure we're good here, is we can just spin our hoodoo pop right around. Yeah, you've got a nice handle built in there. Yeah, if some black stays, that's that's okay, but really I, I, don't, I don't want that too much. Um, I'm cool with a little bit of variation here. Now again, I am airbrushing with no mask on. Um, not recommended long term. Just yeah, wear a mask, guys. You guys know that. It it, it is annoying though, right? Like sometimes I'm I'm airbrushing. My wife and I are watching a movie. I want to talk something. Who is that actor? Something like that. And it's like hmm. I've I've seen conflicting advice on this. Sometimes I see people saying, you know, absolutely don't airbrush unless you're outdoors with a mask on, all the, all, all the things. And then other people will say, as long as you've got something to catch the overspray, it's probably fine. Um. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, I, I wear the mask. Um, I do airbrush indoors, but I, I've never had a problem. Um, I have a little nice little area set up. I put yeah. some kind of cardboard behind there. You might need, how you doing on the amount in there? Um, I'm getting close to needing a little more. <coughs> This is my first time actually using a gravity feed airbrush. Oh yeah? Um, yeah, my, my airbrush at home is a siphon feed. And this is kind of kind of cool, I like it. Yeah, so I'm using, my, <coughs> my airbrush of choice um, is a Badger Patriot 105. I know Adrian likes the Iwata. I think that they're basically the same airbrush. The Iwata Eclipse you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, the Iwata Eclipse. Um, I, think they're, I think they're pretty much the same airbrush. Uh, I, I like the Badger. Um, this is actually the second one I've bought. I, I had one for about five years and I, I really ran it into the ground. Um, I ended up sort of damaging a little component on the inside and I was like, well, I'll just get a whole new one. Um, <clears throat> so this one is, is actually one I've had um, only for a few months now. Works great. I don't know. Honestly, I, I do everything with this airbrush. A lot of people like to make a point about the fact that this airbrush is like a workhorse and they'll kind of say, use that term in a in a way that's like hey it's a workhorse and you're like what is that implying what does that even good? mean yeah um but i've i don't know i i've never had i've been able to do all kinds of awesome things with it so let me say so <clears throat> i've never like we should have practiced with this before the stream but i actually have never used this airbrush before yeah um and i'm picking it up pretty quick i like it yeah, practicing before I the like, tr I like the trigger a lot. Yeah. It's, it's nice. It's nice and big. It's got a good feel to it. Yeah. Is this like an aftermarket trigger? Or no, is this just the one it, it comes with? Yeah, that's it. Oh, man. I want I want one of these now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I've got one more. One more pop. hoodoo. Yeah. Now, right, what's um, our next step? Our next step, we are going to be switching to... Our next color up, it's what we call, uh, well, what AK calls, medium rust. So we did our deep, kind of dark, almost black red. It's really like our base coat. Now we're going to do our first orange, and they call it medium rust. And are we going to wash <coughs> out the airbrush, or are we just going to add in a lighter paint? No, I'm going to I'm gonna wash it out. You guys can see my, my cleaning procedure here real quick. Because um, we do have to go through a few layers of paint here. So I don't want to take too long, but I actually use a syringe. Um, and I kind of fill it up like this. <clears throat> then I take a uh, Q-tip, cotton swab, and I just do a little breaking up of any kind of bits that have started to solidify like that. I set that down. And I don't shoot that through my airbrush. I actually dump it out. Um, the reason I dump it out is because if I shoot it through my airbrush, I'm shooting those like little bits through the airbrush. And I find that my, you know, having to stop and clean out clogs, um, increases when I do it that way. So I like to do it like this. Uh, after a few run-throughs, I will start to blast a little bit here. I keep an eye, see what things look like, but I think that's it. I think I'm done. And so far, just using water, 
When will I use cleaner? Well, I'll use cleaner under a couple of different circumstances. Certainly at the end of the night when I'm done. Um, and maybe if I switch from something like red to white or red to yellow or red to blue, red to anything really. Red to orange? No though, I'm, I'm good on that. Yeah, totally. Um, and then what is this thing that you're spraying the airbrush into? Oh yeah, the, these guys. Um, I forget what they're called. Some but kind of a pot? Yeah, it, it holds your airbrush and you spray into it. It's like a combination collection bin plus stand. Yeah, I like to actually get a kind of deep cup like this too so I can actually spray into that as well. Um, just to see what's coming out and make sure, yeah. yeah. Um, I spray on my hand, I'll spray kind of anywhere. But we're running clear, we're running clean. Um, I can put a little bit of water. It's probably going to be a little pink, a little red. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Um, because we're moving on to a color We're doing terrain, not models. We're do doing terrain, not models. Exactly. Yeah. So next, we are moving on to medium rust. Mm -hmm. And now we actually also have to do our base. Um, so here we go. Um, give this a good shake always, right? Give it a good shake. <clears throat> Load up our airbrush here. And for the first time now, I'm, I am going to give a little bit of thought into how I apply paint to the pink foam. Uh, make sure I'm running good here. Um, I, I'm not, this color, I, I, I like to think of this color. This is when I do models. Um, this color is the color that the thing is, if that makes sense. Yeah, this is the first color after the, the base coat. Um, so I'm pretty fine covering up a lot of the base coat with this. But I like to have like a little bit of variation. You can see here's a spot left a little bit darker. Okay, and so I'm just making sure I'm leaving some of the bottom edges a little bit darker. Again, guys, great place to start practicing airbrush. People are always talking about Zenithal highlighting, how it's a little scary. Um, right here, look at that. So this way this part curves and is almost shadowed and almost inverse, uh, almost an inverse here. I, that means I'm gonna kind of leave that very dark. I think I'm going to leave it pretty much just like that. So we go around here. I'm going to say that's done. So that looks great. Then I do where our, the hoodoos. Again, I'm going to come down on the hoodoos like this. Um, ultimately, we're going to put a cap on the hoodoos at the very end. Oh, there you go. You can see there's one where I put a hole in it. I was talking about that earlier. <laughs> Not too worried about it. It'll be fine. Some snake or something burrowed in there over the years. There's another kind of inverse, uh, another inverse. So I'm gonna make sure that stays kind of dark under there. And pretty good. Remember, we've got uh, a few more colors we're going on here. So if you're like, oh, I left that spot not to paint it, that's okay, you've got more colors. This right here, I don't love. I don't love that I left that like that. You know, I just scolded Brett for leaving a flat edge on his. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna go check mine and see <laughs> what I... Um, but it's, it's okay, you know, I'm not too worried about it. It'll be all right. Uh, here we go, spraying this last one. You can see they come together pretty quick. Super, super easy. Don't overthink it. Okay, I'm going to ask Brett if we've got any other questions. And I'm gonna pass him the medium rust. Oh my gosh, you're, you're asking me to read questions and airbrush at the yeah, same well, time. Yeah, well, let me know if there's a, if there's a, if there's a question and... Uh, yeah, no, that's good. Then, uh, I'll, then I'll pass. So, here we go. Um, Thank you, Ernie. Thank you, Ernie. As how goes it, Titans? Loving these hobby nights. Looking forward to learning all I can from you guys. I'd like to know, how would you guys go about making, like, Tyranid Infection themed terrain? Oh, that's a great question, Ernie. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that, yeah, I like that question. Um, because I have considered doing that for a while, um, although I've never actually really done it. Um, but one, I will say that what's nice about most of the Tyranid kits is that they come with lots of little extra bits. Is it coming out okay? So then yeah. Brett, you kind of want to, one of the techniques I'll, I'll kind of show you is you want to, yeah, exactly, work like, go down on it. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to going up and down. Yeah. Uh, Bridger's laughing, very funny Bridger. S aim down at the top of the hoodoo is what I mean to say. It looks like maybe you ran out of paint. Uh, I like how you hand me like a 85% empty paint airbrush. <laughs> I like, know. Good luck Ask you to read a question. Ask you to paint hoodoos, which you've never done before, with a new airbrush. Brett's doing a lot of stuff at once. I feel like it would be hard. Um, I'll definitely at some point do some producing as um, 
Brad and Adrian and Brian um, probably want to show off some hobby hobby. Uh, no, this is skill. great. I'm loving learning a new thing. Yeah. Um, so, Ernie, I would say save a lot of your tiered bits if you've got them. If you don't have them, find your local tiered player. They probably do. Uh, there's always so many extra little bits with with tiernids. Um and then I think personally the way I, I I've seen some people do it in ways with um, different tools like uh, lots of green <clears throat> um, green stuff and um, putty and I, honestly I find that frequently tiernid terrain looks really messy and like I look at it and what I mean by messy is we want things to look like Tyranids have infested it. But when we look at something, when we look at a piece of terrain, our eyes need to be able to tell what's going on. Um, in real life, if you looked at something infested by some kind of gross insect or something, we've been like, oh, what is that? Like your eyes struggle to understand what's happening. But you don't really want that long term with your terrain. You know, when people are playing on it, it won't make good photographs. So I would say start with a natural environment. Pick a natural environment and start injecting Tyranid bits and yeah. pieces into select areas. This world started as it, <clears throat> as not being infested, and then it became infested. So it probably has all yeah. the same things that the world had initially, just with Tyranid bits on top of them. Be selective about where you uh, infest your terrain. Don't infest everywhere. Um, and let, let us know what this world used to be before it was a yeah. Tyranid world. Yeah. Ernie, I'll say also, um, if you have access to a 3D printer or somebody who is into 3D printing and you can ask them for a favor, there are uh, some really good free Tyranid-themed STLs online that you can download and print out. Um, That's good to know, I don't, actually. I don't remember the guy's name, uh, but he like just went on a bender and made... Uh, dozens of Tyranid themed terrain pieces, put them all on Thingiverse for free, and it's it looks it looks super great. Um, and I just downloaded them last weekend, actually. Oh, nice. Yeah, I think uh, I'm, that's my next project is to convince you to paint some Tyranid themed. Oh, that won't that won't be hard to do. <laughs> some terrain bits. All right. Um, uh, oh, your got, base too. Oh, my base. Oh, yeah. All right. I'm. You want to move on? Oh, no, I guess you can't move on until I'm right. done with this. Yeah, yeah. Right. But I am going to talk about what we are going to do for our next step. Um, now, for our next <laughs> step, we're going to do something a little different. Uh, we're going to paint airbrush. That's not different. But we're going to paint, this is called, uh, oak, well, ochre. They have ER here, orange. And it's actually the lightest color we're going to use. And in fact, it's also our dry brush color. At the end, is the final thing we're going to do. We're gonna paint this next, then we're gonna paint a medium, our medium color over top of it. The reason I like to do that is, I don't, as discussed a little bit last week with trees, I don't really want my terrain to be that bright. To me, this looks like a color I might paint a Howling Banshee or something. I don't want my terrain that color. But I do want this terrain, this, excuse me, this color present in my terrain. So I'm going to, again. You want it to have lived there. Exactly, it, it does live here. Uh, it's not the most recent color to have lived here, but I want it underneath and I want it to kind of peek through in little specific spots. Um, so that's why I, I like to frequently put like the light color in underneath at last. This time, Brett's passing me back my airbrush. And I'm going to kind of do uh, another kind of quick cleaning here of it. And Brett, I could probably take a question. Uh, yeah, let me. Uh, uh, the next question is from Magnus. Yo, you dudes hungry. Oh yeah, we already talked. We already, yeah, we yes. already, that's, that's really on Magnus. <laughs> Thank you though, Magnus. Thank you, Magnus. Your uh, call. We're happy either way. Good to hear from you. Uh, next question is from John Panino. Hey guys, so I've literally been saving garbage because I thought the plastic packaging my burgers came in looked like plasma coils. Do I have a problem? Thank you, John. Yeah, John, that's a great question. Um, I have and have not saved garbage before. I, I really, letting people know that I've, hey guys, I've not saved garbage before is a little weird. Of course, we all know what I'm talking about is I, I've, I've saved it, it sat in my closet for a while, and I've thrown it away. So, um, in general, I'm not the biggest fan of kind of what we call found, I like to call it found object terrain. Um, you went through a phase though with mushroom containers, right? 
Yeah, so mushroom containers I was using to make molds for towel buildings, yeah. yeah. Um, ultimately, I, I, I tossed all those, I, I full, fully made these buildings, um, molded from grocery store mushroom containers here in the U.S. They come in these, they really do look very towel-like, yeah. these, these kind yeah. of rounded. They look like bunkers or yeah. some sort of techie <clears throat> sci-fi building. Um, ultimately, I replaced them all with micro art studio stuff. Boy, I, I hate to say, hey, don't save trash, go buy stuff. Saving trash is, for terrain, is, is great. I think it's a great way to get started. It's if a great you have way to get nothing started. and you're just getting started with your terrain, your terrain group is, is starting from scratch, it's a great way to get, you know, have the bulk shape very quickly. Another one I see people doing a lot is like cardboard product packaging. Yeah. Now, here's what I'll actually say, and I, I mean this with all sincerity. I have not always been a fan of that stuff. If you guys have seen, uh, I think they've only played it once or twice. Adrian on the stream has made a really awesome orc board. Oh man, if any faction wants you to save garbage for a board, it's orcs. And Adrian did an amazing job on that board. Yeah, seconded. He, he did that thing with uh, like the squirt guns where he disassembled dollar store squirt guns. Um, there's a lot of different kind of cardboard and plastic bits in there. It looks incredible. So it lends itself very well. Uh, it lends itself really well, John, to orcs. Um, you know, other factions... It's super selective. Like, you it's know, the, the other one is like construction debris uh, for, yeah. for towel buildings. A lot of times people use PVC fitting. You go to your hardware store and like go to the, the plumbing aisle and you just pick up like all these PVC fittings and, and big six inch pipes with end caps on them. And you get these like domed cylindrical structures that you can then, you know, do sort of a skyscraper or, you know, multiple buildings. And then with a hacksaw, you can cobble them all together. There's a lot of cool stuff you can do there. But yeah, um, food packaging, product packaging, like if you get a TV with some uh, styrofoam in it or something, like that's a great place to start with terrain. Yeah. I think, yeah, like what you'll, you'll, you'll quickly realize that with a little bit of time and some dedicated effort, you can, you know, like we're doing here today, you can, you can do, especially when it comes to like uh, natural terrain as opposed to you know man-made terrain pieces um, you can do some really neat things with with without a lot of time or effort um, or money even you know this foam stuff's pretty pretty cheap I'll say this uh, I, I definitely want Adrian on the stream to show some of it some of the stuff he did with the squirt guns I'll admit it's, it's it, really amazing it's pretty cool I'll admit I've seen videos of people doing it it looks awesome for me it's just kind of a weak spot in what I've done I haven't I haven't worked with it a lot um, I should more. I should I should look back into it. I think, um, I don't know. I've just been into the kits. I've been into you know, GW makes such great kits. Yeah, they get pricey, but um, I love supplementing with pink foam, which is exactly what we're doing here. So, you guys can see with this this light color, a lot of this is going to get covered up. It looks insane right now, actually. Um, I'm not using too much. I'm being a little bit selective here. I'm going to pass this to Brad as he gets started. I'll show you guys a couple of things I'm I did here. So. Again, I, I, going down, aiming down, especially with the light, I'm going to leave my dark crevices, crevici, if you will. I'm going to leave those dark. Um, I'm just doing a few little spots. Like I said, we will cover this up. It's, we have one more substantial color that we're adding to all of this stuff, which is like a, a medium kind of bright orange color. So um, be careful when you use this on one hand. You don't want too much. But on the other hand, you know, it's getting covered up to some degree. So you can kind of be selective about where you put it. I put a, a bunch here, kind of a streak here. You intentionally want it to be, you know, have some orange bits, some brown bits, and some ochre bits. Uh, exactly, yep, just like... You want it to be modeled. Want it to be modeled, want it to look like wacky nature. Um, especially here... Oh, that nature. It's so wacky. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> um, especially what we're gonna end up with here at the top, um, on most of these, we're going to put a cap, the cap that hoodoos have, and, and the cap is usually a little darker. Do you so, want this back? Uh, do you want to do, do this your last guy? Do your okay. last guy? Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> great. So, Brett, while you finish up the last yeah, guy. Yeah, do you want to take another question? Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, this one's from... Oh, shoot, I scrolled. Uh, this one's from Phil. Hey, <laughs> hey Phil. Uh, Good to see you. Uh, hi, hey y'all, loving the hobby content. 
of all the Titans, who do you think is the best painter? That was a pun. <laughs> um, no idea. Um, I, I, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I think we all have different, all have different specific things they're good at, specialties. Yeah. Um, I think you and Adrian specialize in the airbrushing. Um, that's something that's super new for me. I think Brian's also really good at airbrushing. Brian's ultramarines look really good. Yeah. Um, uh, Bridger doesn't hobby a lot, so um, while I don't want to be negative, I would say maybe not Bridger. Um, we're going to change that. Bridger's actually yeah. going to be on the stream next week, uh, sitting where Brett is. And we're going to be doing um, some some kind of fun stuff. It's going gonna, it's gonna to have a little bit of a different feel. We're going to be making scatter terrain for this board. Um, and it's going to be, that's good, yeah. And it's going to be fun. And uh, I think it'll be fun to see Bridger playing around with an airbrush, among yeah. other things. Yeah. No, I think that's part of what this this project that we're, we're embarked upon right now is all about, is like showing that even if you've never done this stuff before, um, you know, it's it's totally attainable. You can you can achieve a lot. Yeah, and that it's you shouldn't be afraid of it. That it's just jump in, start doing it, and and good stuff will come up come from it. Totally, totally start terrain. I mean, honestly, geez, like we said last week, terrain best place to start. Pink foam best terrain to start. Not that expensive, um, and yeah, you can mess up and not feel like you're throwing away like. Some, you know, forge. <laughs> no one would mess up a forge draw model and throw it away. Um, at least I hope not. Uh, but you know, it's, messing up a model. It's, yeah, it's hard. It's it's, it's it's it takes an emotional toll. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah, it hard is one way. Okay, what's our next step? Our next step. We are on to the next color, and this is kind of also like the color the thing will be. Um, this is really the last time we are like full blown applying a color that won't have any kind of, you know, I would say we're going to cover this up or anything like that. This one is Light Rust, AK, uh, AK Acrylic, again, brand, Light Rust. And what I'm going to do with the Light Rust is, again, just kind of work in spots. But I, maybe I'm going to kind of have the most, uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to think how to say this, you know, not, not overthinking this. I'm just kind of putting it everywhere. I am leaving a few spots. You can see I uh, want to leave some dark spots on the the vertical part of it and the slant here. And this is where you can get creative a little bit. Like is this, I mean you obviously have a vision for what you want these to look like, but this is, if you wanted something to look more yellow versus more orange versus more brown, you could play with sort of the ratios and where you apply these things yeah. to achieve that, that look that you're after. Definitely. You can see um, my dark Overhang has remained pretty dark there. Not not a lot's gone on since the first color. I'm gonna put this one on you on the glam cam while you're doing yeah, yeah. the stuff so that while he does that you can see I'm I'm hitting uh, again downward. Yeah, there, there you, you go. can see the finished this is well I guess not quite finished. Not quite finished, actually. Uh, yeah, we have a little bit more steps to do on it, but it's it's getting there. All right. Um Shall we take another question sure. while you're wrapping up there? Okay. Uh, thank you, Assassin Red 42. I was looking at getting a vehicle and it was between the, imp <laughs> the Impostor or Repulsor. I think it's Impulsor or Repulsor. I know the Impulsor costs less, but also can only hold less, but the Repulsor ho holds more and has weapons. Your thoughts? Uh, right, you're going through like a similar uh, dilemma right now in your life. Yeah, so I'm... Uh, I started playing Tau and have recently um, started working on a Black Templar army, and it's an old Black Templar army, so it's lots of uh, lots of firstborn that I'm trying to decide what Primaris, so what, what what of the new stuff I want to add to bring it into Ninth Ed, and um, obviously with Black Templar the the Impulsor is super attractive because it allows you to get out and after it's moved and you can do oh, the, right. you can do the um, devout push to get yourself right, in the right, melee right. which is you know some some black templar only shenanigans but um, i think it basically comes down to do you want a transport or do you want a gunboat and you know the the, the impulsor's not going to kill anything 
And if you don't want to be throwing your repulsor up the field with, you know, to get your guys into, you know, in, in, onto objectives or into melee. It really wants to be sitting back and pounding things with its veritable, you know, like, look at the data sheet for the thing. It's got like 37 guns on it. This <laughs> is right. a, a, a terror when it came out. I know. Yeah. Well, that's because of, because Iron Hands. I mean, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think I'll, actually, uh, Phil, uh, sorry, not Phil, the Phil's last question, Assassin, uh, I think um, the answer that we probably would give you um, is both, eventually. Eventually you're going to get both, right? Let's not kid ourselves here. Yeah. Uh, just, uh, <laughs> you know, start with, start with whatever you need more. Do you need a transport or do you need some heavy firepower? So, how, how's the uh, orange on the hoodoo going? Uh, I'm feeling good. I'm yep. feeling good. Yeah. Um, I feel like I overdid it a little bit on the base, but I'm scaling it back on these uh, on these next ones. Well, that's okay. If you did it, feel like you overdid it a little bit on the base, I will say two things. One, um, one nice thing about airbrushing is that every color is uh, every color is an eraser, right? It's both the yeah. color you're adding and it's an eraser. We actually are going to need to uh, put the dark orange cap on these. And so we will be using the dark orange one more time. And at that point, Brad, if you want, you can touch it up a little. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that was most eye-opening for me is I feel like there are some state things with airbrushing where you can't go back, like with masking. Like once you've masked a thing and made it, and then you go do another area, like that's, you can't, it's hard, but uh, you know, you end up having to redo a step. But um, with this kind of stuff, Especially with terrain, you can very easily just go back a go back a color. Yeah, I feel like um, one hurdle that a lot of people have in life in general, but in uh, in working with hobbying, is the idea that what happens when I screw up, and when I screw up, am I am I how much trouble am I in? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, airbrushing um, is really. Forgiving, especially on terrain, is broken record. I know, but um, airbrushing, brushing is is like I said. Every color is it's every color is the next color's eraser. Right? Yeah, um, it's similar to the quote I've written down today. So you're trying to pour your paint back in the bottle? I'm not trying to, Brett. I'm going to. Oh my gosh! Pour I'm going to zoom in on this. Back so when that bottle. spills all over the place, it's not going to spill. This Let's side. see this. First, look, I'm getting look, rid of any bubbles because let's watch these mad skills. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Always right because we want to save our paint. By the way, I love it. You know, there's always like these these arguments about what type of dropper bottle is the best. Um, in my opinion, this type right here that AK uses is fine. It's it's not the best. The best is the type that um, Minotaire yeah. brand gives. Because it has got that black lid. I don't have any here. It's got that black lid that you unscrew and can just pour everything back in. It's got in. a pop cap, right? Uh, it, it's got a pop cap, but also a black lid that, that, can, can, that can unscrew. Screw. So if you want to pour into it or out from it, you've got a nice big opening that you can... You can but but people are always on Citadel. They're like, oh, why do they put their air paints in, in those... In those? Um, and I'll say two things. One, I actually saw a product, and ah, I forget the name. Somebody, I'm sure, in chat knows. That's like a little weird nipple thing that you put on top of a Citadel yeah. bottle um, and, and turn it into uh, something that can be a dropper bottle. But also, you know, I think, frankly, I think they're thinking, hey, when people don't use all the paint in their airbrush pot, they want to pour it back they in. Pour it back right? in, yeah. I know I do. Um, and hey, look, you know, Citadel paint, not cheap. So... Uh, it's, it's a nice. Uh, it's good. Yeah, it's, it's nice something thing like people always think about dispensing the paint from the bottle, but getting it back into the bottle when you're done is, you know, just as equally relevant. So. Yeah. Now speaking of Minotaur. Yeah. Uh, it, I now uh, would say that our next step is the most exciting, kind of fun step. It's a quick one, but it's where we're going to get to put a lot of character into our hoodoos. Mm -hmm. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to put a little banding on. If you guys look up hoodoos, some of the pictures that will come up on Google Image Search are from Bryce Can Canyon, and um, they show this kind of hoodoo that you can spot there. And it almost is like creamsicle colors, and they have this kind of like white banding on them that I, that I thought was beautiful. Um, 
So I am going to use white now to show you how you can put kind of a banding on. Yeah. Um, and normally I would use Minotaur, uh, Minotaur brand you, Skull White. You really like Minotaur White for this. <laughs> yes, I use Minotaur White on and almost Minotaur, everything. Just real quick, Minotaur is the Badger airbrush paint line, right? Yes, yeah, it is. Um, I have two large bottles of both Skull and Snow White at home. They're like this size almost. For what um, it's worth, after you told me about Minotaur White and why you like it so much, I immediately went on Amazon to try to find some. And yeah. like, you can't, I don't know oh, really? I don't know how you get Minotaur White. Like, I think I, I might not, have ordered it directly from, from Anyone Badger? in chat knows how to get Minotaur White, I would yeah. love to find it. Skull and Snow, both good. Now, But you've bought such a large bottle that you like, you're good for the next decade. Ah, uh, Brett, two large bottles. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know about decade, I go through that stuff fast. Um, so, I forgot it. Um, I have this brand, which is the, the Reaper brand. Um, and I, I like this brand a lot too. I have started using it at home for things. I'm not loyal to a brand of paint. I, I use every brand of paint. And people will say something like, oh, I can't stand this brand of paint, or this, this brand has problems with this color. Not something I've really experienced, to be honest with you. I've never really been like, oh my gosh, this brand and this color, a horrible paint. <laughs> Never really had that yeah. issue. Um, I've yeah. been painting for a while. There's some subtle differences between them, I think, but you have to be really into your craft to be able to discern those differences. And, you know, chances are, if you're getting started with terrain, you know, terrain isn't a great way to figure all that stuff out. Yeah. Buy a couple bottles of stuff, and, you know, if it gets a little splotchy, then it's fine, because it's terrain. Now, Brett, if we could go to the over-the-shoulder, yeah. um, I, like I said, I've not used Reaper's white before, and what I'm looking for in a white, and why I like the Minotaur white so much, is I, I want the, I want to be able to actually just use it, um, imagine you're using almost like a Photoshop tool, I just want to lighten things, right? Yeah, it's interesting, like, your this layer that you're applying isn't so much about painting a white strip on the thing, you just want it to lighten the existing colors. Exactly. Now, when I'm using white, any brand of white, a lot of, lot of pigments in there. Um, and so I always am, I take a toothbrush and I like to like brush the needle off. If you ever get that little, uh, the, the paint forming around the needle and then it splatters, we don't want that look on these hoodoos. So um, this, I'm checking here against stuff I've already painted on, on the paper and I'm thinking, okay, we're good to go. Reaper looks like it's got the transparency thing. So here's how I bandit my hoodoos. I was actually kind of thoughtful about this believe it or not. Normally, like I said, don't overthink things. I tried to put a light color band on the third uh, block or a little bit lower if, if there wasn't a third block. So um, you can see that the idea there then is that the terrain, the topography, um, whatever this layer is, like a sandstone, something softer um, and, and, and a little more light in color. So I do try to be a little specific. I don't want to just be random about where I'm banding. So here's my first hoodoo right here, and I'm gonna band right around the third. And there you can see I, I, spl I got the splatter off. So here I go, I'm banding just a little bit around here. There we go, and that's it, not too much. Like Brett said, it's not about painting this thing white. We do have one more way we're gonna make things a little bit orange. So if I do get a little more white here than I want, I'm not too worried about it. Um, but I'm just putting these little color variations this hoodoo right here, only too tall. I'm still gonna give it a little white. I'm gonna give it a little white right, right around here. This one, I'm not even gonna band the whole way. Maybe, I don't know, something was going on there. Again, like 40 million years ago. Yeah, uh, I think uh, yeah. It's, it's not difficult to explain why there's some blemish on the side of a rock that's been sitting out under the sun for millions of years. Yeah, Brad, are you ready to try some banding? I am. Okay, just make sure. Is, I'm not going to do this on the base, right? This is nope, just no, no, no the... banding on the base, right? And you know, Brett, your 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 point, not too difficult to explain uh, why why we've got color variations. Can you imagine like somebody calling you out on that? Boy, I try to be a positive. I try to I try to be a positive person, but I got to tell me, you, sir, why is your yeah. banding on the third layer <laughs> that, instead of the fourth layer? That would not be my kind of guy. My wife and I like to say that. It, it's not my kind of guy. If somebody came up and said, hey, what's up with your hoodoo banding? It's all over the place. Oh my gosh, I'm getting airbrush paint all over Bridger's mouth. That's going to happen. I, that's only a matter of time. That stream deck is going yeah. to be... Uh, this is the hobby studio mouse right now. Yeah. 
Uh, looking good. Yeah, the banding, not not too hard to do. You can be... Bat is being so careful right now with, with this. I'm... I'm So, like, but that, like but I said, this is, the, this is the first time I've ever mm -hmm. used white not to, like, paint something white, but to lighten the... the that looks great, What's actually. the word Adrian used last week? The... Tint? No, the color that's underneath the... Oh, I don't know. Oof. I don't know. 30 seconds from now, Adrian will tell us in chat. Yeah, I, I can't. Um, I have no clue. Anyway. Uh, it's uh, one in one ear, out the other with that guy for me, I tell you. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> totally, Adrian, if you're there. Uh, undertone? Undertone, yeah. yes. That was it. I was okay. listening, Adrian. Um, awesome wanna, banding. Do you wanna, I think we're good with banding. Yeah, can we glam shot some banding? Sure. Use one of yours. They look good. Okay, gonna uh, put the. Okay, now I will say as as we glam shot here. Sadly, I'm not returning the white. Here's why. Look at that. Mmm, that looks yummy. It looks like a little like a little skewer of pork. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not gonna return the white to the bottle. Um, one, it's the studio's paint, so I don't really care. No, I'm just kidding. Um, of course, I do care. Uh, no, the reason I'm not gonna do that is because you know inevitably, as we're working back and forth with white. Um, you know, I saw a little bit of orange in there. Yeah, I think I think if you don't clean your airbrush out really dutifully beforehand with a light color like white, it's yeah. going to end up back in the bottle. Yeah, so I that. I don't want I don't want to like Adrian's going to like come in here and do a little bit of work and like need white and suddenly is like uh, his white scars are orange scars. <laughs> yeah, something's going to be like wrong. No, no so, bueno. So totally don't want that. Um, plus, you know, I mean, like I said, I use I use white. You were saying about running out of it um, or using it a lot and uh, yeah that's that's why I don't, that's usually, why. don't usually return to the bottle <laughs> um, so I, I do tend to go through it a little quicker just like I go through q-tips wow I go through so many q-tips we keep them at home um, as most people do by my sink um, I've got one of those bathrooms where like the sink is outside of the rest of the bathroom <laughs> yeah is that weird or cool uh, it's cool I'm into it because yeah. I can keep my q-tips on that sink mm -hmm. and be like Hey, grab me a Q-tip, and my friend doesn't have to go like into my bathroom, uh, which I just, in general, don't want my friends. Zach, in. what's the Q and Q-tip stand for? Do you know? No, I don't. Um, <laughs> I bet Chad can tell us, but I don't know either. I, I, I don't was know. hoping it's a brand name. You know, that, that <laughs> I mean, right? They're called. Cotton I mean, I was going to guess quintessential, but quintessential. I, mean, I feel like they are quintessential used for tips. a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah, it's a brand name, and they're probably from like the 20s or something. So. It probably mean, it's probably something weird, a word we don't even use. <laughs> um, I'll, while you're finishing cleaning, yeah. we can ask answer another question. Um, this one is from Evil Morty. Thank you, Evil Morty. Hey, Titans. The train looks great. As a new player, this is really useful. How many pieces of obscuring train would you suggest for a 9th edition 2K game? I'd love to see more of these. Cheers. Let's get some different answers. Don't say anything yet. Okay. Um, I want two different answers. Bridger's still in the studio, so he's going to hold his hands up while Brett says the answer. Okay. okay. Bridger, what do you, what, what's wait, your... Wait, wait, wait. I, I want to see your different answers, okay? Oh, got it. Because okay. here's why I bring this up, um, uh, Evil Morty, because I, I do a lot of the terrain setup for the guys on the stream, and oh boy, if I don't hear one thing from Bridger, one thing from Adrian, and a whole nother, whole nother column of news from Brian when I'm setting up terrain... One, it's like, oh, don't do this. And the next day, they're like, oh, no, you should totally do this. It's so cool. Um, so I want to see what's going on here. Ready? Okay, so Brett's going to say his answer. Yeah. Bridger's going to hold up numbers, and I'll be honest. All right, you guys ready? Yeah. Three, two, one. Okay. Oh, five. Brett says five, and Bridger says six. That's pretty good. Okay. Why five? Why so six? So I think uh, it depends a lot on how big the obscuring terrain is, but I think you want two pieces in each deployment zone so that you could deploy out of line of sight if you wanted to. And then, you know, I was on the fence about five or six, but, like, you want one or two pieces in no man's land. I think it also depends how many objectives are in no man's land. Uh, if you've got, um, you know, if you're on a, playing a mission with six objectives, you might want a piece of obscuring terrain, like, around the objectives to be interesting, or that can also, you know, be a, a bad thing, depending on, uh, you know, which which armies you're playing, assault armies versus shooting armies, et Yeah. But yeah, I think, like, what, is, what were you gonna say, Zach? Uh, you know, I was, I, I like to think like, pr I guess I might have said six as well. Yeah. Um, I like to think two in a deployment zone and two in no man's land. Now, yeah. one of the things that I try to do, and Brett, you and I have talked about this, I've talked about this with Adrian. Um, one of the things that 
I like to try to do when I set up for a board is mm -hmm. I try to make terrain, uh, deployment zones symmetrical, yeah. maybe reversed. And then no man's land, I like to like maybe put a piece in the middle if there's no objective in the middle. And then maybe on one side of no man's land, uh, obscuring. Yeah. And then on the other side, maybe like dense, like minus yeah, one to hit. I agree. I like no man's land to be a little asymmetrical, but yeah. not too asymmetrical, yeah. right? Um, so deployment zones, symmetrical, no man's land, um, not symmetrical. And look, I'll, Agreed. you and I have played some Crusade. I'll be honest, people, people say, oh, I'm, I'm playing narrative. I don't have to do that. You don't have to do anything when you're playing narrative, but man, if you want the game to it's like last two and a half hours, yeah. like unless you want to send your buddy home in 45 minutes, like <laughs> I would set up like that. Even we we still do that when we play yeah, like yeah. narrative or I, play crusade. I really like the idea of having sort of two lanes on the table, one with obscuring terrain and another with dense terrain, so that you can. Uh, you know, if you're an assault army and you want to move up through the minus one to hit, or you want to, something that obscures you and blocks, yeah, um, you can sort of stack yourself on one side or the other, depending on what what <coughs> archetype your army falls into. Okay, so I, I like the five and six. Good, cool. Okay, I feel a little better now. Or I just also just feel wrong, right? Okay, now here's our next and final airbrushing step. Yeah, we're going to use medium orange. We used this color early on in the process. This is the second color we used. But we're using medium orange to put the cap on the hoodoo. The hoodoo should have, this is going to help kind of with the banding look. The, oh, yeah. ho the hoodoo should have a cap. I see and, that now. Yeah. yeah and and it, it, right, it's not super obvious right away. Yep. You don't want it to be super, at least I don't want it to be super obvious right away. Um, but yeah, do you want to put one of those yeah, on the Yeah, I'm going to put one of these over here. Um, so you can see that this hoodoo has a little bit of darkness at its top. Um, and that is what, again, is called the cap. And the cap is like the hard stone that's weighing the rest of the hoodoo down. Um, and again, I kind of modeled these ones. I've never been to Bryce Canyon, but I modeled these ones on uh, the, the Google images and just the images I saw there. Uh, so not only can we cap, but if you, you're saying you're worried, maybe yours is a little too bright. Yeah. I think it looks okay, but if you want, tone it down a little bit. Tone it down a little tone, bit. Yeah. Yep. Again, that's kind of the cool thing about airbrushes. Everyone is everyone else's eraser in one, yeah. way, one way, shape, or form. Okay, Brett. So if we could do a little over the shoulder here, because I sure. want to, I'm going to show the capping process. You want to be pretty careful here. Um, we don't want to cover up our white too much, but we really we do want the cap to go down the sides a little bit, and that's it. You're kind of making like, it. like a delicious piece of candy corn. Or one of my fl favorite flavor combos, creamsicle, yum. You know that nice. orange and, and, and vanilla flavor together? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what are those uh, like bomb pops where there's like the red, the white, and the blue and they're different flavors? Oh yeah, flavors? those are super big in, in the U.S. I think they're like a U.S. thing. Yeah, uh, I don't know why they're called bomb pops, but you know, in the U.S. US is all about explosives, I guess. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, 4th of July, very... Very explosive. Um, so yeah, you're just doing the caps. You're just putting a little bit of, uh, uh, yeah, it looks perfect. That's it. Easy, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Hoodoo caps. Our final step that we are preparing to do after this, we are going to be done with the airbrush. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it kind of one final rinse out here. Uh, and then we're gonna do a little bit of dry brushing. Um, oh my gosh, I'm so wrong. We have one more color to airbrush. Jeez, there's always one more color to airbrush. Um, and this one I'm a little excited about because last week I was talking a lot about tinting things. Um, one of the ways we are gonna get sort of a overall kind of blending t look on these hoodoos um, is with an AK product. This is clear orange. Um, most brands of paint have some sort of clear color. I actually really loved, yeah, that looks great now, yeah. I and mean, I thought it looked pretty good before, but you can looks better now, right? Yeah, a little, and a little more toned down. I'm realizing I missed it a little bit on the edge here. It looked a little overly dark. Yeah. Um, okay, so one of the things I will say about uh, Clear Orange and AK brand Clear Paints, while I was looking at all of the paints there in the store, um, they had so many different colors of, of, of clear like this. Um, <clears throat> GW uh was uh, uh actually recently released 
who was I talking with this about? I think it was Adrian. Um, the this line of paints. No, it was it was my friend Andrew. Um, they released. Uh, who's an amazing painter. He's got a beautiful, you've seen his Night Lord's Army and his Drukhari. Yeah. Um, Andrew was, was showing me that as part of his process, he uses this, uh, one of the new GW airbrush clear coats. Yeah. They've released the line. And man, like GW, when usually Games Workshop releases something, like we all hear about it, right? Lots that, of marketing. That really flew under the radar. Like I never saw any advertising. I don't even know what you're talking about. Right. They have this line of airbrush paints that they released um, not too long ago, and they call them uh, just clears. Like uh -huh. they're and they're sort of like you know non oil they're, and they're inks basically or washes. No, I, I'm trying to think how I'm trying to think how they're different than tinted a tinted clear coats. Yeah. Do they have like sort of the protection element that you think of like a hard coat or something? Yeah, like that? I don't know about that. Um, but they they really um, I've used them a, a couple times. I use them a lot on. Uh, actually, we saw some use of it earlier. If you guys go back later and see that video um, on Brian's purple rocks that I that I made, um, I used it on that. It really like makes things kind of jump to life. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of what this one's going to do. It's really gonna it's really gonna jump the. You can actually see the difference here um, between ones that have had the clear coat, right, and ones that have not had the yep. clear coat. Um, and the clear coat one's a little more vibrant. Uh, maybe we could put, can we put like it a... It ties a lot of stuff together, right? Put a, see if both, see see how it shows on, on glam cam. I don't know how, how, how well Well, this is, hasn't been dry brushed either, but... That's true, that's fair to say. Um, so we've got one finished But you should be able to kind of see the color, the color difference. The one on the, with the hoodoos on it, with the pillars on it, has had the clear orange, the, the AK clear orange applied. The other one is not, and you can kind of see it. It I don't know. It makes it a little vibrant. Um, if you were going to say the first one looked a little flat, I would say the second one looks a little less flat. To Brett's point, fair to say, um, ha be, has not been air, uh, dry brushed yet. Also, so that that certainly helps. Um, okay, so just about ready to do the clear coat. Last step here. I mean, last week I almost forgot to put the uh, the gloss on. The, yeah, the tree. So no, it's it's fine. These we, last steps. You've got your instructions written down, like we just talked about. Yeah, so there's there no way we were gonna forget. No, well, impossible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, AK, uh, not that, right? Somewhere, where to go? Here, uh, it's right here. here okay, okay. <clears throat> uh, clear orange. You can see I've used a bunch of it already, and I'm just gonna spray this guy down a little bit. Is there anything um, different technique-wise for airbrushing a paint like a wash or an ink that is more, I don't know, liquidy for lack of a better word? I don't think so, to be honest with you. Um, whenever you're airbrushing anything like that, you're usually like not super worried about where it's going. Yeah. So if anything, it's, it's easier. Um, okay. Uh, and I'm, I am kind of being a little spotty with this, but you're going to see I'm mostly... I'm thinking of it as yes, I'm being a little spotty, but I'm uh, the spottiness is the areas I'm not doing. So I'm like kind of covering like 60, 70 percent of what I'm about to do yeah. here with this. So I'll start here with uh, the base, and you're gonna see it's gonna kind of sing to life here right away as soon as we add the clear orange. Actually, I know I have enough for Brett and I tonight, but I'm wondering if I need to get some more of this. It goes kind of fast. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, here we go. Hitting most areas here. Now, yeah, it's wet a little bit, so it that's kind of making it look like it's, it's bright and kind of coming to life, but um, it's going to kind of retain that look. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I love this stuff. Um, I don't always tint terrain. I didn't really tint the, the dry trees. But when um, I do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so... Um, I love the way the tint, what it does to the white here. It really is going to make the yeah. white, yeah, kind of have this, I don't know, almost like... This is like a zenithal highlight for for banding, almost. You've painted a white, yeah, put some white down, and then you're tinting that white now. Yep, exactly. Um, it has a funky smell, I'll tell you that. Um, I airbrush a lot of GW normal washes, not their airbrush line. Um, and they sometimes have funky smells. You're asking what's different? I don't know, maybe the funky smell? So you run through this stuff, that's the other thing I would say about it. 
I'm gonna pass this to you, Brett. Um, I'll fill it up for you here. You do run through this stuff fast. If you guys have ever shone a bottle of non-oil through an airbrush, oh boy, I can go through <laughs> a bottle of non-oil through an airbrush on, on some terrain I'm doing in about 15 minutes. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> the fastest. T 15 minutes, uh, yeah. yeah. It's like it's like 9.50 for a bottle. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an expensive 15 minutes. Um, you, can, you can, yeah, go through those pr pretty aggressively. Um, and then that's it, so uh, as far as the airbrushing goes. So we do wanna give this a second to dry, so that's good that, that, Brett's, that Brett is doing some here. Um, you wanna take another question? I can take another question, uh, and then yeah. we'll, we'll get to the dry brushing, yeah. Um, this one's from Dean G. Thank you, Dean G. Ernie, what was it like to fight Bolo Young in the 1988 action film Bloodsport? Oh my gosh. Um, I, Dean, I, I mean, we can't answer that, right? Have you, yeah, I mean, we, I can't answer for Ernie. <laughs> He's asking Have you ever Ernie. seen Bloodsport? No. Uh, Have you? N no. Uh, well, I feel like I did, probably in the era of, you know, approximately 1988. And, uh, <laughs> I don't have the best memory from that time period. Yeah. Um, have you seen, well, this came up before the stream, but have you seen the movie uh, uh, Labyrinth? Yes, you're asking oh, about Labyrinth. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> I have seen Labyrinth. Why were you asking about Labyrinth? Because we're making hoodoos. Oh, that's like the little the little goblin guy. The, like, the guy who's like her helper, but also... Uh, no, there's that scene where he's like, you remind me of the babe. Oh, yeah, yeah. The babe with the power. Who, you do? Who do? What the, power? Yeah, the, the power of voodoo. Voodoo? Oh, yeah. voodoo? You do. Yeah, yeah my wife and I love that soundtrack. I, I, was, I was laughing because you and I have very different... We've s different tastes in movies, I guess, or we've seen a lot of different movies. The Venn diagram of movie yeah, overlap between you and me is, is not a pretty lot of overlap. Small, yeah. um, oh, I feel like I didn't do enough. No, you're, yeah, I'm fine. You're, it's did good. you do your strain. I did. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so this I'm definitely going to put put back in, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't want to waste that. <clears throat> uh, it's pretty easy. Why wouldn't you just spray it out the airbrush into the bottle? <laughs> that was oh, a, man. That was, that's a trap. That's a trap. That would be don't so funny that. to watch. No, it would not be funny to watch. It would be, I mean, as long as you're not cleaning it up, right? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> okay, so we've got the wash applied. And then, are we are we good? Are we just dry brushing now? Just dry brush is all that's left. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to give this airbrush one last kind of rinse out here. Okay. <coughs> um, um, can I get started on that? Yeah. So but, um, so I've got some I've got some brushes here. Yeah. So I picked these up today, actually from a craft store. Yeah. We're um, not this, using our our rhino hair brushes today. Yeah. We could, um, but I, I don't know the I, I I don't want streakiness. Yeah. Like that. So um, I picked up these kind of uh, I, I call these ugly brushes. In my at home, I have a I have a bin labeled ugly brushes, and they're just all like craft brushes. Um, and I use them. I ride them yeah. into the ground until they're like caked solid. Have you um, ever used makeup brushes? <clears throat> no. I've heard other people recommend them, and I've never tried it for this kind of thing. You know, dry brushing terrain. I think makeup brushes for me, honestly, it seems like they might be a little too expensive. Are they? Like they're very they're inexpensive, you know, just a two dollars or something oh, okay. for something this big. Okay. Yeah. So maybe uh, maybe yeah, right. those would be good. Um, but yeah, I always kind of like to have those on hand, like a big bag of like not particularly yeah. beautiful brushes. This is great for ones. terrain. Yep. Yeah. Um, now for my airbrush, uh, just so you guys know, my cleaning technique. Um, I use different cleaners. I use kind of whatever I can get my hands on. I do like this MIG generic cleaner for both brushes and airbrush. Um, and I'm going to put a little bit in there. And for the rest of the stream, I'm just going to kind of let that sit. I'm going to run it through a little bit. I know that there's no big paint chunks. So I'm going to run that through a little bit, let that be in my airbrush just for a little while um, while we move on to dry brushing. And okay. Brett, really, there's no um, amazingly secret, awesome technique here. I'm gonna take the, we're going back to a color we've already used, I usually like to do that. Uh, and this color is the light ochre, ochre or okra, depending on how, this is ER, uh, orange, or orange. Orange, There's yeah, so that's right. Ways. Yeah. And, if you're uh, from, if you're from <coughs> Maryland. Yeah, you're from, 
Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to squirt some of this on is our that, Is that how you say? Is that how you say it? That's not how you say it, right? It's Mary, Maryland. No, Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think it's Maryland. I know. I think so too. Um, <laughs> that was a joke. And I'm going to get some on my brush. I really don't want very much at all. This is a little wet here over here still. Uh, some of mine actually look a little, a little damp still. And we're not using a wet palette today. No wet palette today. No real reason to? Yeah, not, not really. Um, okay, and then we're good. So really just, you know, just like last week, pretty basic stuff. Um, we don't really want, if you've done your work, and by done your work I mean uh, you've done a good job cutting the pink foam and you've, you've put the little crevices in there and stuff, then you're going to find that the, the, the ho uh, hoodoo will, will take your paint pretty easily and it'll show up on the edges. You can get all the areas, even dark areas. It's a cool look. And that's it. Oh, I like this. Yeah. Yeah. The crevices, the, the edges pick up the dry brush really well. Yeah, and I, again, I'm not too, like, uh, like I was saying last week, you reminded me, I said, if you ever meet a person who brags about their dry brushing, yeah, I took offense at that because I consider myself <laughs> a dry brushing pro, Zach. Yeah, um, I don't know. I think that's a little like like an athlete being like, "Hey guys, I'm really good at like like a 50 yard dash," you know. <laughs> but there are people who are really good at 50 yard dashes. I guess it's an Olympic event. Zach. No, that's true. I, I boy, I'm I probably opened up a whole can of worms with that. Um, I don't know. Maybe you know, like I think, I think dry brushing is a great like early technique that you can learn early on in your painting career that has uses in, you know, advanced forever, uh, really, forever. Yeah. But like, it, it's a great way to build your confidence when you're getting started with painting because it's very easy to get amazing results. You yeah, know, it's like, and, uh, no, you, you're absolutely right. And if you do get a bizarre streak, one of my favorite erasers for bad streaks on a dry brush is just like my, my thumb. I'll kind of just soften it by like rubbing it a bit. And if it does, that doesn't quite work, might dip my thumb in a little bit of water and try rubbing it like that. Um, but basically I find that, like you're saying, it is a good technique. It's, it's something everybody needs to be able to do. And it goes a long way in terrain, frankly. Um, I, I find my issue with dry brushing, I, I would say, I caution people who say, ah, oh, it's, it's this beautiful technique. You get these awesome results. And then you kind of see somebody like dry brush like a Marine. And you're like, that's not where you want to use dry brush, yeah, on, right? <clears throat> you don't want to do it on hard surfaces like that. Yeah. You want to do it on organic things. I look, I've been there when I first started painting, uh, like really get trying to trying to paint a lot of models. I uh, probably 12 years ago or so. I, I think I dry brushed my first pass through my towel. You know what I had? I, the other thing I laughed at after last week was you said there's two things you don't want to end a a model with. You don't want to end with. I'm going to use your finger technique because I did too much. Yeah. You don't want to end with dry brushing and you don't want to end with a wash because those are the things that you're not in control. Mm -hmm. Like I did, when I got back into the hobby a few years ago, like my towel army was all like washed as the final step. <laughs> I was just laughing when you made that comment because I was like, yeah, it was, yeah. It was, it was a way to get, get a bunch of models painted, but like... After, and I thought they looked cool when I did them, but then like after the fact, I was like, eh, I could do better than this. And now I'm working on going back and redoing them with the with an airbrush, actually. Yeah, um, I, same here, Brad. I, I like, I, I've ended models on dry brushing. I've ended models on washes. I mean, I, I when I say that, I'm saying that because I'm telling you guys, I'm speaking from experience. Like, if you if you end a model on, on those steps, it's, it's out of your control. There's, there's really no other way to say yeah, it. Yeah, you might get a good result, or you might get <laughs> might completely ruin it. Are you gonna get? Yeah, like are you gonna get get that good result continuously over the whole army? Yeah, probably not. Yeah, um, maybe All some. Right. How's, how are you doing over there, Zach? Good. I'm using I'm using on the base. I'm using the thumb technique a lot. Yeah. And I'm even getting a little water in here sometimes uh, because I don't want what I really don't want when I dry brush. Um, I'll, I'll take almost anything I can get when I dry brush. Anything that comes out, usually we're good. I don't want it to look like it's been dry brushed. I don't want it to look like somebody came through with, with a paintbrush uh, and, and, you know. You don't want brush marks. I don't want brush strokes, yeah. I mean, that's, that's really what I'm saying, right? Ideally, you want, yeah, you want it to look almost edge highlighted. 
yeah, like a sloppy edge highlighting. Perfect. Now, here's the other thing I'll say about this, Brett. If we could go to top down just for a second um, yep. on, on mine, I'll, I'll say that this top here, which is now finished, um, we have to add the hoodoos in, but that's about it. This top um, has a little bit of like kind of a flat, not super, you know, it, it's got color variations in it, etc. cetera. Um, here's, you know, one of the finished ones here. And these guys, one of the things I'll, I'll say about them is they have, uh, you know, honestly, I think sometimes the look here, when you're just looking at the tops of these, the look is almost like when you go to that, that competitive event and you can tell the guys who put it on were working hard all night long the night before with their airbrushes on the terrain, you know? Um, and then they were done. <laughs> and of course, like, I get why they're like that. They've got to paint you know, yeah. 40 ruins in like eight hours, right? right? They don't have time for washing and edge highlighting. But one of the things, reasons I'm okay with that is because when I personally put these on the board, you guys can actually see um, in the video, Brett, maybe uh, could you hit, yeah, the first video again real quick? Video one? Yeah. yeah. Um, you guys can see, I almost always kind of cover these guys with these little stones and stuff. Um, and so I personally don't want my hoodoos to be too busy. Another technique you could do here on the hoodoos, um, maybe we'll show on the stream one time, you can take steel wool and kind of spread it over a chunk of the hoodoo and then airbrush into that and it'll kind of almost make like a marbling effect. I've, I've done that before actually. Oh yeah, or, I, or dryer sheets I've heard also. Dryer sheets that. or um, alcohol wipes after they've dried out. You can yep. do a lot of different stuff. Um, I just didn't want to do that with any of these. I wanted to get it, um, I wanted to get it uh, like, Oh, there we go. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I wanted to get it uh, uh, just out. But, you know, the pebbles are going to really look good. So, like, add the pebbles, you know? Pebbles, moss. You guys saw some moss in there, of course. I love my moss. Moss, yes. Yeah, I think, I mean, that's a good point, right? Like, it's okay if these look a little bit plain because we're going to add scatter to them. We're going to add mm. rocks. We're going to add moss. We're going to add barrels and crates. We're going to add other interesting visual details. That can you can always add those things, but if they're baked into the hoodoos themselves, you can't take them away if you want something to be a little plainer. Exactly. Okay, now our final step is we need to attach our hoodoos, our hoodoo pops here, to our bases. Um, earlier today, I had a tool on the table, and it was this tool right here, a set of pliers. And Bridger saw them and was wondering why do I have pliers? Well. I said that I had done some of these with Elmer's glue and some with Gorilla Glue. And I said earlier on the stream that um, we'll have to find out which ones I've done which yeah, way. Yeah, this will be, uh, oh my gosh, I'm ready to get elbowed in the face. Yeah, here we go. That one was, that one was uh, Elmer's. That Wait, was... are you left-handed, Zach? Uh, not really. Oh, okay. I can airbrush. I can do some stuff left-handed. I don't know. Because if so, we're sitting, we should swap sides. Are you left-handed? Like... No, I'm right-handed, okay. but we're like... Oh, if see, you were left-handed, we'd be bumping each other. This is a Gorilla Glue one. So, here we go. Teachable moment. If you're like me, and you used Gorilla Glue on some of these, you're going to grab... There's, well, there's two approaches. One, if you want to save your skewer, which why not, right? By the way, don't use these skewers on food. You guys knew that, but don't PSA. do it. PSA, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, save these skewers for another hobby purpose. More hoodoos, maybe. Um, and then I did give a little twist to kind of break some of the bonds. And then... Yank, and there you go. Um, the other technique, I said there's two techniques. You could just clip it and glue it with the, with the rod in it. People are like, oh, the rod will give it stability. I'll yep. tell you what, I, I don't love that. Um, one of the reasons I don't actually That's like That's what it, I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, one of the reasons I don't actually like including things like rods and stuff in my pink foam is that if you do that and they break, they'll break bad. Um, mm. Right now, if these break, the hoodoo's just the hoodoo's going to pop off the base. It might take yeah. some paint with it. Um, <clears throat> which would be annoying. I'd have to touch that up. But if they have a rod in them and they break, it's going to be a mess. It's That's great. I love that. Probably so you're done. thinking about how it's going to fail and, <laughs> yeah. and designing in a mechanical fuse so that it fails in a safe way that's easy to repair. Exactly. I love um, that. And uh, by the way, I'll say one other thing I actually, I actually thought about over the week and I meant to bring up, um, now that you bring that up, Brett, Another thing when I make these hoodoos, when I make terrain in general, and these are a great example, um, I often think about where they will be stored, but more importantly, like mm. the device they'll be stored in. So I almost always start, this is a new thing, maybe a few years back, I started all my terrain projects by buying 
the you know the containers that they will be stored in. Yeah. So that's the I, first thing. The first thing. And when I cut my hoodoos out, I'm like putting the bases in. I'm saying this this container is going to be hoodoos. This container is going to be ruins, and the trees are going to go into ruins um, because I don't usually like to put like plasticky things in the same container as pink foam because it'll punk puncture a lot of holes in it. Um, and so I, I usually kind of measure it out. I make sure like how many hoodoos can fit in this container. That's so smart. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like how many people out there? Well, I, um, I know I've had this experience where I built a table full of terrain. I went and bought a bunch of tubs to store it in and I, I put it all in and like, I've got it in two tubs and there's like one piece left. And I, for the life of me, I can't, get that last piece in the tub. Like, man, if I'd only had these tubs when I was building this terrain, I would have just made this one thing just two inches shorter and it yep. would have fit perfectly. And then you're kicking yourself. Yeah, you guys, uh, <laughs> I, I, again, nothing I've learned from experience. If that's one thing I could say to you guys. Um, some of you, I, I hope, are getting excited and want to make some terrain sometime soon. And um, buy your storage containers first. Like. Um, <laughs> Where's a good place to get storage containers? Uh, well, honestly, it, it's kind of funny. I usually order mine in bulk, like in these six packs. Yeah. Um, off, off online. Um, but in the U.S., the container store is pretty good. IKEA sells that. IKEA. Also. I, I like mine to be um, Home Depot. Honestly, sells them yeah. as well. A lot of Target. Um, I, I like to kind of use a consistent brand so that people will like. Um, Maybe if a lid ends up here, it can go on. It can go over on this right. container and having, there's else having lids that are universal. Yeah, that's a great. I use Stairlight brand. I have like so many brands here today. We're bringing up. Um, I use like the Stairlight brand with the one with the pr purple handles mm. on all mine, um, <clears throat> and I use only like three sizes, which is like the big one. I think it's 32 cord or something. The thinner, the shorter one, and then like. The small one for scatter. All right, I'm gonna try pulling these off. We're gonna see if yours are glue. Twist or... first. You don't. You sh if it's if it's if I used Elmer's, then you shouldn't. That no, nope. that's a grill or nope. one. So I use this to twist it. Yeah, a little bit. Give it a little twist, and then. Oh man, this is just grab it and yank. It's. <laughs> <laughs> I just see that like aimed right at my eye. I like to yeah, I like to put it. Uh, oh my gosh! I this like is to do really in there. Can, can I show you? Yeah. I think the best way is like that. Nice to like pull that way. Got it. Um, you loosened okay. it for me. So. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Zach. Oh, stabbing you with this. Um, this one, yeah, this one was in there. Like I can see chunks of the. I know it was. <laughs> that it was one was right in there. Yeah, some are easier than others. Um, that Gorilla Glue is actually, I thought I had it here, I'm wondering where I put it. Um, it's actually what I would normally use to then glue these down. Mm. Um, and so today, uh, no, we, let's finish them. We'll use the Elmer's, it'll be fine. Actually, Elmer's glue is kind of nice. Where did it go? Oh, here. It's kind of nice because, again, if it breaks, it's usually a pretty nice break. Yeah. So, um, okay. Uh, if we want to do a little over over the shoulder, actually, let's just do top down on both of ours. This is the fun part. I know Brent loves assembling things. Yes, this is the part I'm in. You know, see, I'm already like. Yeah. So when you're doing this lot, with lots of things like like tufts of grass on a base, um, you want to avoid a couple of things. You want to avoid like anything too uniform. Okay. Yep. And you want to uh, avoid. Well, I guess that's it. I think that's the big one. I like to, avo I, I imagine, we talked about the game purpose of this, or we yeah. talked about that we would talk about how these work in game. We haven't yet. It's five inches tall. It's actually a little over five inches tall. Um, I like these because I'm imagining a ninth head 40K. These are going to be used to have the obscuring rule. They're basically going to be the ruins on they're my They're like ruins. On yeah, my they're functionally board. ruins. Yeah. Obscuring, and then you can hop up into them. But I want to leave room for like, you know, I, I like to think what kind of squad wants to hop up into this. Um, and so I think about just like little infantry units, you know, yeah. five five marines, five primaris marines is kind of like what wanna, I, what I want to make sure I can get in. Yeah, here. yeah. So I I tend to kind of group in a way that's like I, I'll put two or three together and leave some space, and that's it. And then we glue. And then, do you find yourself like scratching the paint off where the 
No, not not even. No. Okay. Wow, that's simple. Okay. Now, the only step we're not going to show you guys on the air is I would then hit, I will hit this with Tester's doll coat. And I really do recommend it um, because, honestly, I, I find that some of these pieces can, the, if you don't use, like, Tester's doll coat or some kind of, some kind of sealant, um, it can cause these guys to stick to each other in your storage container. Um, actually, I did oh, yeah. this. I they did this to Brian one. one time. I I painted a new board right right before COVID in January 2020, and I gave it to Brian, and it had all these marble slabs. And you know, Brian is like this Canadian nicest guy on the planet, and he kind of like I kind of went over to get it from him because um, I needed it back, and I could tell he was like, "Hey, like this happened." You know, he's also a very direct guy, so he's like, "Hey, look, this happened." And I was like, ah, this is my, I knew it was my fault. Um, because I painted and like just stacked them in the container right away and, and rushed it over. Um, and so they stuck together. And when he kind of started pulling them apart, they, they traded paint, as they say in the uh, professional racing circuit. So uh, no, no paint trading. So definitely give these guys some testers doll coat or something like that. Oh, I'm just like, I'm like keeping the glue from Brett. Uh, you can't no gluing until I check your previous step, Brett. <laughs> is this is this uh, how do you feel about this placement of? It looks great. Looks good. All yeah, right. I love it. Um, it's gonna get permanent. So that is that is kind of it. We're gonna have some maybe I don't know if we have any more questions. Yeah, I um, think there's a few more. Yeah, I'm happy to answer those, and also definitely want to talk about some things coming up uh, this week on Titans. On the stream. Ooh, a mouse is, is the mouse not behaving? Click. Ah, uh, yes. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, hoodoos. All right. Um, thank you. Magnus did nothing wrong. What are your thoughts on using pink foam with liquid nails and sand? Back in fifth, I made a Mount Ferris theme board with barbed trenches, made it six tiles, and the combination made the board solid. Uh, liquid nails. You're, I, I'm, I'm imagining Magnus. It's like a construction adhesive. Yeah, yeah, and he's using them. I, I, I'm thinking with the word barbed. You're kind of creating little, little. Uh, I, I don't know what Mount Ferris is. Do you know what Mount Ferris is? I don't. Um, um, I'm assuming it's a mountain. Yeah. I'm assuming it has some sandy texture, some some coarse texture on it. Yeah. So Magnus, I like I was saying earlier. Um, so I, I'm thinking you're kind of making like little shapes with the liquid nails and then sanding over top. Um, I think you said sand, right? Um, I think, you know, like applying a layer of glue and then sprinkling sand yeah. over it to give it some texture. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I've i done stuff like that before. Um, I, like the video I showed you some I did flocking on. Um, I, here's sort of my thought about sand. If, you, if, if you're gonna paint it, um, good. If you're not going to paint it, I, you know, I, personally I don't recommend it. Um, there's actually, if you go back and watch this stream on the channel back in November of 2019, there was a game that I actually played on with my towel against Brian when Iron Hands were, were insane. And um, I had, I had a, a board that I had at the time that had a lot of blue sand and these towel buildings. Yeah. I since have repurposed those towel buildings for the snow mat. Um, you know, sand you got to paint it, I think, and painting sand can be can be sloppy. Um, you really need to, Magnus, you've done it, so I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but you really need to let that sand like turn into cement, which is yeah. kind of what cement is, right? Yeah. So, um, I, I haven't worked with sand in a while, but I did it on that board, and I, I didn't love the look of it. Um, it's a very different art style than what this this is here today, like. It's almost like a step in the direction of realism. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this style of terrain making is almost intentionally, like, you know, I, don't, don't take this wrong, but like cartoony. No, like you said it earlier, yeah. It's like, um, you know, when I see something like this, I almost think of like World of Warcraft, which is a very stylized art, you know, it's a very like clear art direction. Yeah. Um, and. You know, the models are obviously hyper detailed that we're playing with, but the terrain kind of, you know, provides ambiance. It, it suggests a setting and a, you know, a feel and a tile set, but it's, it's not the star of the show. Yeah. And that's like, if you, if you were to put a ton of effort into making the terrain very hyper detailed, I almost feel like 
you know, edge highlighted, zenithal highlighted like models might look weird because you're like, you know, playing with playing with GW style Space Marines on right. on like a model train layout. Yeah, like, yeah. It would it would it would it would look weird in its own right. Yeah, so I, I, I actually really like this art style of of terrain that you do. Thanks. Yeah, um, I the, exactly what you're saying is is kind of my thought process. And I see Magnus has, has mentioned Fenris, not Ferris, um, mm, which is Space Wolves. Yeah, um, super cool. Uh, but what Brett's saying is kind of my approach, um, and it's a approach. It's not the only approach. But yeah, yeah in general, I don't like, like I said, I, I don't like to add a lot of stuff to my terrain so that when you look. Your eyes are kind of going, whoa, it's like a whole uh, diorama there, yeah. right? Like that's really, the diorama comes in when now we start adding, ter you know, space marines Models shooting each other, yeah. right? So yeah. um, for me, I, I like to, I, I always think about that. So Magnus, um, that sounds super cool. Um, yeah. Oh, he, he's adding some clarification here. I covered the whole board in liquid nails and sand as a coat for the board. Yeah, so he's yeah. applying texture via the sand. And then the trenches had nails and barbed wire. It looked great, but got hurt yeah. a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, that yeah. sounds like, you know, those the classic GW ruins with the spires that you lean over and poke yeah, yeah. your eye out? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, cool. Any, any other? Do we have any yeah. other questions? Thank you, uh, Joseph. Thank you, Joseph. Love the stream. This is so cool. Would love to hear your thoughts about what Imperial Guard terrain you would make with pink foam. Mm. So um, one thing that I've always wanted to make and, and um, have not made yet is I've always wanted to make a, uh, basically like these kind of bunkers. One thing that I am going to make in, in the upcoming uh, weeks, month maybe I'll say, uh, is this way to put, this isn't exactly Imperial Guard, it's more Adeptus Mechanicus, but the way to put some of those um, Sector Mechanicus pieces in a base that has like these kind of concrete walls up one side. Um, yeah. So I, I would like to make kind of like for Imperial Guard, I would almost cut the, I would almost cut the pink foam really straight. Okay, which can be hard to do. You gotta be really careful. I, I would cut it really straight and I would almost make like a, a base and then like two walls on kind of on one side, like maybe going up at an angle and then one on the back and then like a little wall here so that you can put like, I, I imagine like, I want to be able to put like a guardsman and a heavy weapons team in yeah. there. And it's basically like a little bunker, yeah. right? So I've always wanted to do that. And then you can stencil um, on the sides. You can stencil like markings. You can use a lot of your decals that way. Yeah. yeah. I, I, have this, um, I have this dream of building a table that's like a, uh, for a uh, beach landing mm, scenario. Yes, yeah. Where there's love, like... Brett a, loves a good beach landing. Uh, <laughs> so I have this... I have this vision of a uh, Tau flotilla of yeah. devilfish and hammerheads coming in off the water. There's like a very D-Day beach with emplacements and tanks, Imperial Guard tanks like nestled up into bunkers and with sandbags and just like, you know, stuff getting blown up as it runs up on the beach and uh, and then, you know, having to make your way. Anyway, I feel like the Imperial Guard in like a situation like that the terrain you could do with the pink foam was basically have a rocky outcropping, do a, a rock formation, and then cut into it, mm -hmm. and then put in a GW plastic kit. Oh, uh, yeah. And just like yeah. insert it into the rock face that yeah. you've made with pink foam. And so there it's not, you know, like it's a mashup of a plastic kit plus foam. Yeah. The foam makes really good natural terrain less it's harder it's, to it's make, harder it's harder to make it like building that's right. buildings out of foam i agree um although you know you sort of cross that line a little bit on the mars board with those concrete yeah sort of uh, and then just the arch slab the just arch. like the giant yeah. concrete slabs yeah right giant concrete slabs yeah yeah um but you don't want to push it too far definitely uh thank you ernie do you guys make your own playing mats or buy them if so, how would you recommend making your own? Ernie, oh, we, that's a good question. Ernie, we buy them. Um, I think there are some sources out there now that will let you upload kind of like your own image yeah. and do it. Um, even then, I'd be very careful. Like, um, I, I've not seen one yet, I, so yeah. I don't know. I, I've not seen one. I, I haven't shown up and the person hasn't said, Hey, I, I I worked on this this pattern that looks like grass or whatever. Yeah. Or I took a photo of grass and doctored it a little bit in Photoshop and sent it into the company. So I've heard that you can. There are companies that'll do this with like the the play mat, uh, 
you know, that we, the, the, the neoprene play yeah. mats that we use. Um, but those can be very expensive. You know, like even an off-the-shelf one is $90 retail. So, uh, you know, a custom one is going to be even more than that. Um, what I have seen people do for custom play mats is go to a vinyl sign company. You can buy these signs. You know, it's like a PVC. It's like a, a banner, essentially, with mm. grommets in the corners. And it's meant to, like, put in front of your store when you're having a Memorial Day sale or yeah. whatever. Um, and you can get, if you're not interested in rush shipping or anything, you can get one of these made for very reasonably priced, 20 or 30 bucks for a 4 by 6 Yeah. You can send them any art to put on it, and they'll print it on one side. And they'll have... You can specify gloss or matte finishes, so you can you can dull it down. It's not as nice as the neoprene, um, but it's also going to be you know a tenth the price for a custom uh, a custom play mat. And I've seen this done a lot with uh, with Battlefleet Gothic for space mats. Oh yeah, yeah. So you can find some like super high resolution Hubble image from a space <laughs> telescope, yeah. and download it for free from the space agency. And send it in to have a custom playmat done for your spaceship game, mm. and it's it's a super cool. That's I've fun. never done that, but um, that's yeah. I, I think that's a neat idea. Yeah, I um, mats are interesting. On one hand, they really elevated the way I thought about terrain, like meaning that I, I start seeing these mats, um, and I would be like, oh, here's this awesome mat. I, I can do this with. I can do that. But I do yeah. have to say that sometimes they're limiting because um, I have looked around at like the custom mat. I, I do like the neoprene one. I don't. I don't mind the price point because I feel like you get a lot out of it. Yeah. Um, but rolling dice on a neoprene mat is just so it's, satisfying. It's, it's nice. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we yeah currently Ernie we we're buying off our own. But there are a lot of good companies out there, and a lot of companies are starting to kind of branch out, and make like niche ones that are a little exciting. Yeah. Um, We've talked about this in the past. I feel like GW is really missing out here. Like, they could make a mat with their own IP logos on Like, yeah. like nobody else can make a mat with an Imperial Aquila on it. Or yeah. a Tau, like, Sept symbol on it. Um, and GW is the only company that can do that legally. And I don't know I've, why they don't. I've, I've, yeah, we've wondered why they haven't. Um, and I hear I hear all kinds of people suggest all kinds of reasons, and I'm I don't know I don't yeah. know what to believe, but yeah. yeah, but yeah, there's a lot of them really good. And now the, nowadays, like I feel like five years ago, making your own was a thing that you might do if you had a really specific idea of a mat you wanted. But nowadays, you know, Frontline or any of the other companies out there that do these have huge selections of them. Yeah, here's what I'll say: I, I I've not found a mat company that makes a bunch of mats, and if I did, I wouldn't say this. I've never found one. Um, that I'm like, Ugh, I don't like their mats. What I will say that I like about Table War and Frontline, um, those are the, 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 I think probably the two big American companies that make them. Um, their mats tend to be a little more like, again, I don't want to use this word offensively, but cartoony. Yeah. They're a little brighter. Um, a lot of the European companies, um, GameMats.eu, Urban Mats, I've used mats from all these companies. Um, and I, lots of them have amazing. Um, the European ones tend to be Maybe a little more realistic. A little more historical. Yeah. That's not always a good thing though. But right. sometimes it's what you want. Yeah. Yeah. The the um, the one board that we're I'm excited about, you and I are working on the the mangrove forest yeah. with the Caribbean shallows map from Frontline Games. That our trees are gonna go yeah. on from last um, week. Exactly, right? Very excited about that board. It's just this beautiful turquoise water, shallow looking water. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Cool. Good question. Um Thank you, uh, Kaldorf. Let me scroll to here. Here we go. Really enjoying the hobby stuff. Any plans for a basing video? Also, as a total noob, I would love to see stuff on brush techniques, highlighting, mixing colors. I'm tired of buying so many pots. Yeah. Um, Ooh, contentious question. <laughs> um, yes, uh, Kaldorf. So we have a lot of stuff planned. Um, and uh, so, so you're aware, these first two streams have been terrain, next stream will be terrain, and what we kind of are doing is sort of tying it to what else we're doing. Um, yeah. And right now one of the things that I'm doing is making a new terrain board. That's what this is all for. It will be on the stream. Um, Brett and I have some projects coming down the pipeline as well, so you'll see us like pivot to being like, hey, we're building swamp terrain for the next f four weeks. Um, and then the perk at the end of it is, Tune into Tabletop Titans on a Thursday night, and you'll get to see the board that we built all the terrain for 
you know, a month from now on the stream being played, uh, you know, a game being played on it. Yeah, being 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 used in a, in a way that uh, I'm just like, oh my god, Adrian, I need a more moth. <laughs> I'm sitting at home. <laughs> Um, so Adrian and Brian are going to be like, don't let Zach produce on a day when we're using his board for a the first time. A brand new board, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, but yes, as far as stuff like you're saying, absolutely. Um, I've done yeah. all those things. Um, two weeks from today, uh, probably won't be doing training. Going to be paying a little Craft World Eldar. And, well, actually, I, I have a custom mixed color that I use in my Eldar um, that I, we'll kind of talk about how we do. So... Um, lots of plans for not just airbrushing, but yeah, like brush techniques, that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, this our our plans for this time slot, this Wednesday uh, live stream, is uh, are, are are very wide and varying. So we want to do painting, we want to do modeling, we want to do uh, sort of more building. I'm excited to do some 3D printing related content here. Um, we're gonna we're gonna put a 3D printer down, and, and we're just gonna watch it. We're just gonna yeah, sit here. We're, we're all gonna, like, gonna watch wow, the 3D isn't that printer. Amazing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, uh, and and so I think we're gonna we're gonna explore lots of different aspects of the hobby. Um, we're interested and passionate about lots of different aspects of the hobby, and so uh, you know, we, which we talked about earlier. I think each of us will sort of lead a content stream that is something that we're excited about, and yeah. we're excited to bring that to you guys. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Any other questions, or did we do it? Uh, we did it. Um, oh, Magnus has one more question. Uh, thank you, Magnus. There are solid neoprene mats for X-Wing if you're looking for BFG. Yeah. Do you like using water effects for terrain pieces, or do you feel like they look too fake? I avoid it because I, <laughs> because I get a ton of bubbles. Yeah. Um, I... I feel like water effects for me falls into that category like we were talking about earlier of like too realistic. Like uh, I, I don't need that level of real, like if, if, if I'm building a model train set, like I absolutely want sand and water effects and all of, all of that. Um, but I feel like for this style of tabletop gaming terrain, yeah. um, it, almost, it almost is like, what's that term in film where they like the something divide where if if a cartoon character looks just a little bit too realistic, it gets like creepy to you. Oh yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, I do um, know what you're talking about, but I don't know the term. Anyway, I feel like if if tabletop terrain, if if it looks too sort of realistic, uh, it ends up looking worse almost. And yeah, and for me, like water effects falls into that category. Like I've seen some amazing dioramas with water effects for for people who do dioramas and for railroads, um, but I feel like for gaming terrain. I, that's not what I want. I don't yeah. know, what are your thoughts? No, same. I, and I, I'll also say, Magnus, I've not used water effects maybe in 10 years. Um, I think when I did, I agree with you, I, I, I didn't love it. Um, I've seen um, people use it. Again, I've I mentioned him last week on the stream, a um, guy in the local area, Seth, um, who, who uh, super awesome hobbyist, Hobby Sensei, I think is his name on Instagram, does all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah. Um, Seth does that stuff for his dioramas. It looks amazing. But like Brett's saying, it's... Um, one, like, where is it going to go? Because if I'm on a mat, water is usually the lowest point. So I can put a bunch of uh, pink foam down and have water underneath of it. And we've done that before. Yeah. But I don't love that look because then I'm playing on a bunch of pink foam and not mostly the mat. But I could do little water effects, maybe little puddles and things. I might be into that. I might give that another go. Ernie, if you're excited about water effects, check out Play on Tabletop. It has a video that they put out recently that where, where they built an entire... It's, it's modeled after the uh, the planet at the end of Rogue One that mm. they had the big battle on. Where oh, these yes, sort of like yes. Archipelago. You showed me this. Yeah, super um, cool. And he uses a ton of water effects on that in that build. And he builds the table. For, and it, it's, it's very important. It looks great. Uh, but again, it's like a very different style from this kind of terrain. It's like yeah. very realistic. He does sand on the beach, and he's got like little waves and stuff. And I feel like really cool. you put a, a um, edge highlighted space marine on that, and you're just it's just just like it's not quite right. It doesn't quite. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I sort of want my terrain to be a little cartoony, but yeah. I know. Yeah. I feel like everyone's got a different art style, and um, and if you're looking for it, like water effects is can be really really strong addition to that. So yeah, realistic, more realistic style. Yeah, we did. Um, if you guys want to see a watery board that that they played on, um, Melanie uh, and Adrian played last Thursday 
on a, they played AOS, Age of Sigmar, and uh, uh, Melanie had her Idoneth uh, Deepkin, and so we made kind of like a watery board yeah. um, for them that we had the stuff laying around for, um, and you can kind of see, that's my Magnus, that's my uh, limit to water effects, <laughs> frankly. All right, it's called the Uncanny Valley. Oh, yes, right, right. Thank you, thank you, Phil, thank you, McDermott. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, we have a, another couple questions that have come in. Uh, Ernie says, thank you, Ernie. Would be cool to see a Tabletop Titans custom chapter slash army that we can all build and fight across the world. That's a super interesting idea. Well, there is High Fleet Titan. They oh, for Tyranids. Yeah. Uh, we would probably get in a fight about what that was. What army would be the <laughs> Tabletop? I feel like... Actually, I'd, I'd, it wouldn't be a fight because a majority of us play Tau as our primary faction. <laughs> Four of the five people <laughs> who do stuff for Tabletop Titans own Tau armies. Own Tau armies. Uh, and, three, and, and three of us for three of us is our primary faction. So I don't yeah. think there would be a fight. It would just be. <laughs> uh, it would just Sept, be that Sept World, Sept, Sept Titan. Yeah. Sept Titan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you, Michael Cody. Love the stream. Have a great Thursday. Thank uh, you. That's sweet. Yeah. Thank Thanks, you guys. So much. Well. Uh, we did it. We did it, yeah. So a couple things coming up on the channel in the next couple days. Uh, tomorrow, uh, they are, as always, playing a game. And we have a special guest, the energetic, exciting Nick Hayden um, from Blood, you know, Blood of Kittens will be back. He was on a few weeks ago. And, man, I, I was here. I produced that game. That guy's energy is just great. Yeah, like, love Nick. Yeah, yeah. super fun. Can't wait. Um, really fun to just have him around. Uh, afterwards, we were chilling out, uh, eating some cookies that Magnus had sent. Thank you again, Magnus. And um, just what a guy. Just just a wacky dude. Um, so he'll be back tomorrow. Super encourage you guys to watch that Saturday. Lots of new stuff coming out for forty k players. Yeah, I. I almost it almost doesn't matter to me what game is being played on Saturday because there's just going to be so much content to talk about. Yeah. Um, points values, new missions. We're going to be playing a game with the new with the new secondaries. Uh, so really looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, so everybody's going to say, "Oh, nothing's new. Um, it's just rehashing of the old ones." And I, that's true. But man, that stuff like adds up fast. Like even when they changed, when they do these changes to secondaries and stuff, like it it really it changes the game it changes in, the in game small lot, but very yeah. important ways. Um, and I'm super looking forward to. It. I feel like. A lot of the secondaries have just become, you know, auto takes because yeah. uh, everyone's figured out what are the easiest ones to what, to score for. We the we we, uh, we have had this is normally a Bridger job, but we've had the experience of making the secondary image that the guys use on the channel at the during the intro where we talk about the secondaries. And uh, so I was saying uh, to Bridger and Adrian, I was like, you know, we should just start saving these because yeah. lots of times it's They're like deploy the scramblers, <laughs> uh, Otha moment if you're Marines, and domination. Yeah. It's like, let's just save that pack, right? And, uh, I'd gotten in the habit of just like randomly trying out the ones that nobody ever uses just for hipster reasons. And I don't even remember that. What's the one cut off their head or the one where you have to like kill the warlord <laughs> as that. soon you as did possible? You to me once. And yeah. I'm like... Every time I take it, everyone forgets about it, and yeah. I score it like on the first. I think I think I did, did score it on me. the you first turn me. against yeah. you. Yeah. It was like yes. Very embarrassing moment for me. Thirteen points. Yeah. This never happens. <laughs> um, and I think I think that's it. So, uh, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Super excited as always to have you here. We're gonna see you next Wednesday. Uh, so, from all of us at Tabletop Titans, reminding you: be kind to each other. Be kind to yourself and always be creating.